Way, way to ruin the intro, Josh. Holy cow. Hey, welcome, everyone. Welcome to Pords with Patriots, episode 26. Uh, things are going well in the basement. Josh was just making a comment. He got a new mouse. He's, he's happy over there, my producer. Um, but uh, more importantly, very excited about episode 26. Um, episode 26 is very different than what we've done in the past, I think. And uh, very excited to have my guest on, um, PhD Dr. Kenneth Yeager. Mm -hmm. From the Ohio State University, so I hope he hasn't watched all the uh, episodes where I've made fun of Ohio <laughs> State. Um, but he's been there since 1995, right? Yes, sir. So, um, and what's fun about this is it, this is uh, always exciting for me to meet someone new. We've talked a little bit before, but uh, if you've seen the post up here, this is going to be a very, hopefully, very educational episode for everyone within the group, and then whoever is listening on on YouTube. And and um, I'm just going to hopefully that I'm not getting overanalyzed. Ken promised me that. He wasn't going to overanalyze me on this uh, on this podcast, but uh, we decided to have Ken on. A little bit more about Ken is like like we talked about before. Uh, Ken is a doctor of philosophy. Um, he's a licensed independent social worker with the supervisor dis mm -hmm. designation. designation. Yep. Uh, licensed independent chemical dependency counselor. Um, a professor of clinical in the department of psychiatry, and the director of the Ohio State Star program, which we'll talk about hopefully later mm -hmm. in the. Uh, in the podcast. So um, I've, I've been to pull a quote that maybe you remember where I got this. This is a quote from that you may have may not have posted something. So the first quote is we always start off with. So not until we are lost, do we begin to understand ourselves from Henry David Thoreau. So I stole that off of your LinkedIn yeah. um, profile last night when I was stalking you down here, <laughs> uh, getting a, uh, you were creeping on me. Uh -huh. yeah, it's, it's, well, I mean, it was one of those things like I've been excited about. It's a little bit different. Uh, this is a really different podcast because a lot of the things that you're going to talk about, I have no idea right, right. about them. So it's a little bit different. So I figured like I'd try to figure out a little bit about you, but I, I thought that was a very powerful quote and a good thing to lead into because, you know, a lot of people that you're dealing with um, in your career. And then a lot of the, the reason why we started this podcast um, a little under a year ago was to deal with people that are lost. Yes. You know I mean? so, yeah. And, and, and thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for bringing me into your basement. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's it's cool. It's cool. It's fun. So not many people can say that. Thank you for bringing me into the basement. Oh, yeah, cool. you know this yeah. is this is I've been to scarier places. Let me tell you. I don't know when, but I have. Uh, yeah, you know I think the idea is that everybody at some point in their life gets lost, and and you know I'm I'm a big fan of Thoreau, and when when I read that for the very first time. I, I wondered how many times I'd been lost, you know, and um, it it is kind of in the line of work that I do. I, I came into the work that I do kind of through the back door, um, not not knowing exactly what I was going to be doing, not knowing exactly what it was going to turn out to be. Um, I don't think anybody wakes up and says, hey, I think I'm going to work in psychiatry. But I did, and um, it's it's been an interesting and amazing journey for the last twenty eight years of my life working in in this area and and understanding that that there's no end to where the mind goes, and and the more people have been lost, the more they grow, the more they have to share, um, and when you asked if I would be willing to come on. Um, you know, this is a sharing process. This is a healing process. This is an understanding process. Right. <clears throat> and that that's why I said I wanted to come on. Yeah, and we've been, I, mean, I can't thank you enough for coming on. And I, I don't want to thank Dan. Um, he's down in the basement, episode one, the lost episode we were talking about. But Dan was actually uh, my first guest. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and if you remember him, Dan's a formal Naval officer, um, still doing great things. But, you know, I asked him, I, it was, you know, he's out doing FEMA stuff. You know, only saving people's lives. But I asked him a few months ago to to try to you know find someone that that uh, we we could bring on to talk about the issue that we're. I guess we're. Not, I don't. I don't want to say we're skirting it, but we talk about it a lot. And, sure. And, and one of my biggest fears, I think, I told you is, you know, we're we're doing this, we're dedicated to this, but I don't want to say something wrong where I, you know, trigger someone the wrong way or or you know what I mean. But you know, I'm who I am, and 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 we just I can't be thankful enough to have you come on and, and talk us through. Yeah. You know, the, 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 you know, 
someone who's an expert at it and get their opinion on it. And, and hopefully that reaches out to someone who's listening. You know, you're not listening to, you know, Che or mm-hmm. a guest drinking and, and talking. It's it's a legitimate, you know. Yeah. You know, you've been doing this for a long time. And it's I funny have. you said you weren't sure because if you look at your education, you started at Ohio State as a Bachelor of Science in Social yep. Work. Yep. And then you got your Master's of Social Work. Yep. And then you got your doctorate of philosophy with social yep. work. So that feels like you knew what you were doing. Like yeah. All along. Yeah, it was a pathway. Um, I came in. I would never recommend this for anyone. And by the <laughs> way, the reason Dan's here is I've got pink slips in the truck, and those are involuntary <laughs> admissions to the hospital. But you need a physician. We need two signatures. And and Dan's an authorized he's signature. So like, oh. I, I thought it would be good to have him here so it works out. Um, yeah, my path is kind of strange. Um, I didn't plan it, but when I, when I got my first run at Ohio state, um, I was asked to leave after the first quarter and it might've been my 1.1 grade point average, or it might've been setting the dorm room on fire, deep frying (laughs) psilocybin mushrooms. I don't know which it was, but it was one or the other. And they asked me to leave. Um, and I did. And um, my father said to me over my dead body, will I pay for your tuition? And um, I'll come back to that line in, in a little bit. So when I went back to school, I finished my associate's, bachelor's, and master's in three years back to back. So a batch, um, an associate's is usually two years. The bachelor's is two years on top of that. The master's is two years on top of that. And I did all three of them in three years. So the normal school, that's six. At Ohio State, it's three because it's, you know. Well, it's it, is, it is the I Ohio State, State University. There, right? So I think the most I took was 36 credit hours and a quarter. And and I wear this this uh, pen wherever it is on my jacket. It's going the opposite. Yeah, it's yeah, the yeah. I'm looking at the screen, looking at the wrong <laughs> side. It's it's a national honor society. I ta- graduated in the top three percent that year, and um, you know, I kind of knew where I was going. It was kind of a time in the field where you actually had to have a a, a master's degree and an independent license to practice. So I had a lot of motivation to get through those. Right. Right. Um, but again, it, the motivation was not so much holding on to the job, but staying with the people. Right. That's, right. that's the goal is, is staying with the folks and working with the folks. Well, if you've listened, one of the, the first things I ask people is normally what drove them into the military or whatever, but like, what was your driving force that you knew, like social work, psych, you know, psychiatry, mm-hmm. what, do, when did you know that that was for you? You said that that was very, you knew that, um, obviously to, to put that much, you know, work and energy into it. You had to have something that was driving you. Well, first off, um, when you're a freshman at Ohio State and you're deep frying psilocybin mushrooms, you're treading on very thin water. <laughs> um, and and it's it's funny. In high school, I took the armed services test and, and was third in the nation. And, you know, I was doing LSD when I took the test. So... <laughs> That's probably why I scored so high. I have no idea. Um, But I was kind of researching substance misuse all along. (laughs) You were living it? I was kind of, it it was, you know, uh, a a very good friend of mine um, and I were, and we're still best friends. His his father was um, a dean of the College of Pharmacy. And one weekend we were looking desperately for something to, get our moods changed with. And the only thing we could find were Demerol suppositories. And, you know, we're <laughs> doing the Demerol suppositories. And I looked and I said, you know, there's something wrong with this because right. this isn't really social use. <laughs> well, I think um, to me, this is interesting that you're, you're being so poor. This is what I love about this is it's like people come down to the basement and, and people are very open. And I, I couldn't be more thankful for that. But one of the things I think is funny is that, that, the, the the what you're into and we'll, we'll talk about it as we go on mm-hmm. is I feel like you know when I've always talked to someone that's in the mental health field or something like that they it's like a judgmental type of I always feel like I'm being judged and those are people uh, that really didn't understand the things you've done so to hear you say that you're kind of like man you you've been a guy that has really been no I've been trying there. to find your way or like not you know knowing that you haven't been probably doing the the smartest things in your life right um, right 
But yeah. I think that's important when you're connecting with someone, right? Well, let, let's You don't tell it, your patients that, do you? Or? I do. Oh, okay. I like I, this. Sorry, I, this is I great. do. Um, I tell my patients that that you know, you're not you're not going to bullshit me. <laughs> you're you're not going to tell me anything that I probably have not experienced. Um, and I I said the same thing to my children when they were teenagers. It's like, look, you've got a stacked genetic deck and we'll talk a little bit about epigenetics as we go on. Um, but the, the generational transfer of genes from generation to generation to generation <laughs> leads to this. And, and just to give you a little deeper background, my, my grandfather migrated to the United States just before the start of World War II and went back to World War to Germany and World, or World War I and went back to Germany in World War I. Um, my father came out of the hollers of West Virginia uh, right at the start of World War II, had never seen indoor plumbing until he ended up on a battleship and went to the South Pacific Theater. And uh, dad was in the Battle of Midway. And, um, you know, there's a long family history of drinking to cope with war experiences and, and having difficulty dealing with what it was. Uh, to the extent that my mother's father was born, is still buried at the state hospital um, because he drank himself to oblivion. Was he a so vet as well? He was a vet as well. He okay. was he was World War One. Both of both of my grandfathers were World War One vets. Both of them had immigrated to the United States prior to World War One and then went back and fought in Germany in World War One. I. I can't think of anything more horrific. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting bringing that up because that's, I guess that's a good way to talk about a subject. So, you know, Poor's with Patriots, you know, we have, we have a lot of supporters, but we have a couple of people that have been very critical about, you know, drinking and, you know, and, and veterans, you know, I, I, I know for myself, like I, we, we talk about these things. Like I definitely think I self-medicate with alcohol. Mm. Um, and I know, you know, I think everyone's different, but that's interesting to hear, like, even back in World War II, you know, in World War One, that was some of the things that were still going on. Like, what's your, what's your, what's your feeling on that? Can, can you, yeah, can you self-medicate yeah, the right way with alcohol? I mean, is that the right way? Well, I mean, is there I like, think... is there a, is there a tipping point or is this like, are we, yeah. I find even for me, it's, it's, it, it, I've seen for me personally, it, there's some days that I have really bad days. It just lets me. Chill out a little bit. Yeah, you know? sure, like, I, sure. Like for me, I, the only drugs I've ever done are since we're like sharing. Mm -hmm. um, I've never done mushrooms. Somebody was mm -hmm. asking is if you if you deep fry the mushrooms, does it make the effects better? So I wouldn't know that. Maybe you would know the answer. To that. Um, no, it makes them <laughs> taste better. It was was the thought process, you know, because I'm going to I know I'm going to puke after I eat these. So maybe the aftertaste won't be quite so bad. No, but so, I've never, you know, I've yeah, I've never smoked marijuana. I've done none, none, the only drugs yeah. I've ever done is alcohol. Yeah. Okay. So, so let let me answer your question. You don't have the genetic makeup that I have. Okay. And only about ten to twelve percent of the population of the United States have that genetic backup. Um, most people can enjoy, can you know, utilize to relax. Um, can have fun with it, can enjoy the tasting of all the different types and everything. I'm just not one of those people, you know, and there are probably dates that come back to you that are harder than other dates. Right. There are probably times of the year that are more difficult than other times of the year. And if, Alcohol does not cause problems in your life and it helps you to relax. And it's not a bad thing. Um, I think the simplest definition, you know, people ask me all the time, well, do I have a drinking problem? Well, I don't know. If alcohol is causing problems in your life, then it's a problem. All right. You know, it's just, let's just keep it really simple. So is that definition, your, the definition of your problem? Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, what's a problem to that person, right? So, so, like, so yeah, a problem. Like missing the, work to me would be like drinking where I miss work. That's a problem. Right? That's a problem. Missing yeah. events in your family. That's a problem. That's a problem. You know, like uh, getting uh, arrested for, you know, drunk driving. Problem. That's a problem. Problem. Yes. I think problem. I like problem. Yeah. Waking up in the morning, splitting headache, having to down 
1,800 milligrams of Motrin in a bunch of water. Not a problem. Not a problem. <laughs> Survival. <laughs> Subtle difference, you know. Um, yeah. If, no, but I if it's just... a if it's a Sunday morning, yeah. But if it yeah, if it's, it's a, Monday, if it's a Monday or if it's a Thursday. Or if it's a Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, then maybe it's a problem, you know? And I want to apologize up front before we go into the episode is if I'm uncomfortable or some of the things, I'm going to make a joke about it. So they may not be funny. I'm apologizing to no, you and everybody no. else. That's kind of the way to do it. But, like, we've all been there before where you know. But I I, I just want to ask that question because, yeah. you know, the, our idea behind this is, like, I, you know, we, we, we've we inclu- we've included whiskey because it's, it's a big um, – I huge. feel like whiskey a, 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 has brought me to a lot of great people. Um, it's actually helped me in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. you know, but I understand the problem thing, but there's a lot of criticism when, you know, you start telling people that you're dealing with, you know, veteran suicide and alcohol. People are just like, oh gosh, this is, you know, oh, yeah. are we contributed yeah, to yeah. that. And I, I'm, I'm not looking for a validation to say we're right, but I, what you said is right. If like, if you're drinking alcohol and it's, and it's causing a problem in your life and that, and it's a problem. that definition of your problem, you know, you have to really understand yeah. what a problem is, right? Exactly. You've got to understand and you've got to define for yourself because nobody's going to be able to define that for you. So, and I didn't launch into that to make you or anyone else uncomfortable. It's just, it goes along with the territory. I thought you were talking to Jason, but that's I was, to, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk to him again <laughs> later. And again, we've got pink slips. So okay. it's okay. Um, yeah. It's um, but that you were asking me how I knew this was right for me. Right, yeah, back to like when you did and, social work. And you know what? I saw that there was an avenue that I could take my life experiences and use those to help somebody else. And when when you get that opportunity, you can't pass it up. You can't miss it. You can't say, well, yeah, I know, but I'd, I'd rather go you know, do X, Y, or Z. When, when you have the opportunity to make a difference in somebody's life, you have to show up and you have to do it. You have to do it right. And, and you have to do it professionally. I got a lot of flack um, going through the academic process because I was pretty open about my life experiences. And a lot of people were saying, well, you can't be a professional. You're biased in what you do. And it's like, well, kind of my thought process is if if I can talk to a person at a one-to-one level about what they've experienced and understand it, I'm probably less biased and maybe even a little bit more able to be related to. I'm not going to say that I'm more effective because I don't believe that's the case. But 90% of accurate human interaction is when people can relate to one another. Right. And and that's that's what I was banking on, and that's what I was hoping for, and and then comes all of the other things with being in academe and and having to publish and having to research and having to do all of that stuff, which is is um, is quite the challenge. And that is where I I originally started working in a treatment program where we treated impaired professionals, physicians, nurses. Um, attorneys, engineers, all professional people. Dentists. Yes, yes, dentists. I had um, to throw that out there because I just read something about dentists being uh, off the, the Very, train for very one. high on the, on the suicide risk yeah. train. They're third, yeah. Um, and I realized that there wasn't a person coming through there that hadn't been traumatized by what they do. And, and that got me thinking about mental health. So I left the addictions field and went to work in mental health. And I got into mental health to treat trauma. And mental health wouldn't do anything about the drinking or the drug use or whatever. And I was, I was kind of thinking, how, how, how in the world do you get these two to merge? How do you get them to come together? And now, 25 years later, let's say, the STAR program has been in existence 15 years ago. And the STAR program, we started it to support healthcare providers who see things that nobody should ever have to see, to do things that nobody should have to do, much like your group of people. Right. You've seen things that nobody should ever have to see and done things that nobody should ever have to do. And to help them to deal with that so that they don't get to the point where there's maladaptive coping. And, and to me, 
when when you called and said, would you be willing to talk? That's the idea. Is that how do you catch people before things get out of control? Before the real damage occurs? And and how do you help them to understand that the guy that works in the place that I work, the psych hospital, is not out to get you. And I make jokes about pink slipping you and hospitalizing mm-hmm. you against your will. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that we're all there to help. And the STAR program, to tell you how big it's gotten, we've started doing peer support and teaching other people how to support each other. And it's fascinating that our peer supporters now, we've trained over a thousand of them, and they're doing about 2,000 support interventions a month with one another, which is huge. Because when I started doing this at the medical center, people would never ask anybody if they're okay, which is different from the people that you work with. Because right. you're always checking in with one another. Yeah, they are checking, but is, do you really? What answer do you really want to get back? Is the question. Like, there's a lot uh, of people that I think that that's, that's true. Yeah, there's tons of people always checking in, but like, um, is it really the answer you're getting back? And I think that's where the the problem lies. Is most people, if you know, they're not doing well, um, and and you know, my peer group. And if you talk about what we, you know, we've, you know, when, when we came with the name like Patriots, it, it kind of opens up a lot of stuff. Yeah. We we're focusing right now on veterans, but mm-hmm. you know, we've had a couple of law enforcement officers, you know, right. we, we have talked about first responders, you know, when I talked to you early in the week, you know, I never thought like, I thought about doctors. It was kind of like when you, you brought up a, a case of like, you know, you know, a doctor just getting covered in blood, something going wrong that they didn't think, you know, something went, went wrong. I never thought about that in that way. Yeah. And I mean, you're kind of like, eh, and I think a lot of it, you know, not to, I'm going a different direction, but back to the original thing you said about asking people is, I don't think we're honest with ourselves. And, and if somebody asks you, you really need to be like, you need to be honest. But the problem is, is, you know, you have to be careful. I, I feel like you have to be careful with that because what you tell people can be held against you pretty quickly. If yeah. You know, professionally in your professional thing, you know, especially in the military, people are still on. If you walk up to someone, they're asking how you're doing and you start breaking down and tell them that you're doing awful. You want to kill yourself, all this kind of stuff. There's a, you're going to, you're going to, you're going down a road that you don't even, right. That you, that you don't, don't even want, want to go, go down. down. I mean, right. you, you need to go down that road, right? Cause right. that's how you're feeling. Right. But there's a party that's like, Oh shit, if I do that, then this is this, this, and this is going to happen. And, and, and that's the hard part about, you know, um, so, that whole thing of so that's what's got to change yeah and that's the question like i thought you were going to have the answer for us on that yeah. what do we do to well, change I that can't. no, no I, i'm kidding no. I it's, uh, but I it can't. is a change that happened like it, it's funny like you brought up the star and, and we'll, mm-hmm. we'll we'll post some stuff on the in, on the page later on yeah but you know star is at ohio state university we talked we actually talked about i think a few episodes back mm-hmm. um i've been trying to educate people on stuff but it's a dedicated team whose sole purpose is to identify educate um, and treatment of those who survive trauma and people who support them. So, yes. you know, trauma is not just like, you know, everybody has trauma. And I didn't think of that the same way. Like, that's the other th- part about, I think, veterans. And sometimes we think, like, we're the only people that have dealt with this stuff, right? Right. And, and that's not the case. We're not no. unique. We're not special, no. right? 90% of the population will experience one trauma in their life. Right. 90%. It's ubiquitous. There's no getting away from it. You got a parent, you're going to lose a parent. Right. That's traumatic. Right. And I actually brought that up. So what is trauma, right? Like yeah. I, I have, the, I have a, the definition that you looked at and I'd like to hear you talk about. So trauma is an event, series or events or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening. Mm-hmm. It has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and on their mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. So Ken just told you 90% of people go through that. So that's that's when I think the first steps of the people in the military, like is, is it a different, like did, did I see something at a different level? Then maybe a doctor. Yes. But, yes. but you still have, or have been subject to a trauma, right? You've still been subject to a trauma. And, and it's not as much what you were exposed to or what you saw, but really what kind of coping skills do you carry with you that, that makes the impact different? And a lot of people experience trauma and and don't have any major impact of trauma, but there are certain factors associated with trauma that make it come closer to home. Um, seeing somebody that could be, you know, a family member. Right. 
or happening to somebody you know, or, you know, having your own life put at risk and, and that close call. Those are all the pieces that are part of what trauma is. And there's a predictable response to trauma. Right. So those that experience the trauma are hypervigilant. Yeah. You begin to see the world as a less safe place. Yeah. You 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 wonder what's going to come at you next. It, is the next shoe going to drop? What's happening? And and I don't know. I I I expect that most of your listeners have been hypervigilant at some point in their life. It's a survival mechanism. We're hypervigilant because it keeps us alive. Right. All right. The next step when a person is exposed to trauma is to try. Well, you talk about the cope, not before you go on, you talk yeah. about the cope mechanism. So I'm, I'm listening to yep. um, Once a Warrior, Always a Warrior mm -hmm. um, by, by Charles Hogan. He's a, uh, I think he's a medical doc. He, he's a former, you know, Colonel medical doctor talking about yep. stuff and it's a long audio book. Um, mm -hmm. And, and one of the things like the cope me mechanism we talked about is like, one of the other things is like, like you said before, everybody is, prone to it but those coping mechanisms like th that's where i think a lot of the, that's the first start where people are like okay there's a you know there's you know six of us down in the basement we witness something right mm -hmm. we witness the same thing we experience the same thing we experience the same trauma mm -hmm. or event five of us are fine right right and that other person you know a year or six months later is just Not shot fine. by it, yeah right so is that a, you know, I, you know, there's a, like you talk about coping mechanism, but if, you know, especially in the military, we're trained the same way we're, we're trained mm -hmm. to deal with some. So, so one of the things he talked about, maybe I'm wrong. It's a, maybe it's a coping mechanism or not, but there's like just people that handle that trauma differently. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's not a weakness. Like everybody would say yeah. normally though, five people are fine. The other guy or gal is there's something wrong with them. They're really not. They just yeah. don't. They, they experienced it differently. Right. Whatever it was, they experienced it differently and it overwhelmed their coping mechanisms. It's not that they were weak. It's not that they were not smart. It's not that they were not prepared. Whatever they saw hit them in a way differently than it did the other four people right. in the room. Right. And, and the other piece of it is, is that everybody will respond differently to the same trauma and not everybody will recover from the trauma at the same, at the same rate of speed. So and and some are better at hiding it than others yeah yeah so it, this is this is not anything but the individual response to the life experience which i think is important because i think that's the basis like you know veterans i thought about this today earlier is, is you know if, if you have a bunch of veterans that are talking to each other you know we always want to make jokes about you know i was in a tougher unit or i had a yeah. tougher mos right, or right. i did this and i was in five ieds and i did this and all that kind of stuff and the, the, that that's we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot with that, right? I mean, well, we're at saying, times you when we're talking it. to other people, because if you're tr struggling, right? Yeah. This guy, you know, you're Ken, you're struggling, and I find out, oh gosh, you were in this unit or did this. I'm like, what the fuck's this guy's problem? I was a Navy SEAL, I did this, and I I don't have a problem. This this person was, you know, loading aircraft in mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia, you know, and they and, and they, they have, have a problem, problem. with this. Yeah, yeah. It's it's just a matter of the individual response to the experience. Yeah. And, and it's fascinating to me that once you have the trauma experience, it can come back to, to haunt you when you least expect it. Um, you know, because traumas build on top of traumas and they grow and they grow and they grow and the experience becomes bigger and bigger and bigger um, to, to a point where folks need help. And that point is when it overwhelms their coping mechanism. And and the single most important coping mechanism is having people to talk to, people that you trust to talk to. Right. So, but when we start going down a path of wrong coping mechanisms, so the first thing is hypervigilance is just the response. The, the first coping mechanism that starts to go sideways is when you start avoiding people, places, and things that remind you right. of the trauma. Normal response. It's a normal response to an abnormal circumstance. The next situation that if you can't avoid it, you've got to try to control what's going on. 
And there's a lot of people who are control freaks around this stuff. And we never understand fully what it is until we understand fully what they've experienced. But avoidance, back to avoidance before yeah. we go. Sorry. It's like, so avoidance, you know, you're talking about like for, you know, veterans are like a large, like things like right, to like large crowds, crowds, loud noises, loud noises. Um, you know, you don't want to go to an you... OSU football game. I think I've been there. I mean, I, I yeah. think it's, it's for some for some people it's okay, for some people yeah. it's not, right? I think yeah. that's another thing to, to understand. I think that's the problem is like you, I, as you're talking about these, that's the one thing is some some people it is avoidance, and avoidance is that it, it is that simple. It could be 15 people. It could be yeah. They don't like being around 15 people. Like where you know to me, like you know I I most recently where I felt uncomfortable. I went to the David Chappelle show on New Year's Eve. Mm -hmm. um, how they have that going on while you're getting out. Um, I, I, I will tell you, I got a little antsy because it was like, I didn't have control. I couldn't get out yeah. of here. They were limiting it, the access to get out there. There's tons yeah. of people around you. Yep. And my wife was even you know laughing about it. It was like, it's fine. I'm like, you're fine. You're fine. But I'm, but I'm, I'm being hyper aware. I'm like, I don't like, this is the perfect, like in my mind, I'm thinking like, this is the perfect time that you do something yeah. horrific to people because yeah. we can't you're get trapped. out. We can't, you can't. Yeah, go. exactly. So and, and I'm trying to, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to interrupt you at all. I'm just trying to kind of relate it to yeah, um, the experiences that, that that I know in our com the community that we're trying to reach out to. And that's one mm -hmm. of the things. So it's very important. Like there's people, and that's one of the things is no human being is meant to be isolated, right? Like we're, yeah. you know, and especially in the military, if you've left, you've been really close to people. And then all of a sudden you have no one that's, that's not good for, you know, that's not good for that individual at all. You know what I mean? So no, you're, you're being alone in your own head is a dangerous place to be. Especially so, yeah. in my head sometimes it's. Well, I, I'm, I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> from the, from the hour before you're like, <laughs> like it's going to give them a notepad over it. No, but no, yeah. but it's. But but that, that's just, I'm just trying to expand it more. It's like everybody else to the whole. Yeah. No, that's fine. There's a different gamut of like the things like i can normally go to a game and i'm fine like um you know there's just there's certain things like the other day i thought i heard fireworks like it yeah. goes off and it's just it's like yeah it's february who the like fireworks aren't coming so you think something's like something else is yeah going there's on. just like the, yeah there's a weird like it's just not normal so that's right 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 well and you know that's not limited to the veteran population with mass shootings going on every day right, right. Yeah, you know, there's there's an entire generation that that's their greatest fear, and and you know we're still dealing with that. Right, right. So um, if you can't avoid it, you try to control it. Right. So you would have done anything to be able to control that end of the show and that feeling trapped and taking control of it and getting yourself and your family and those you care about. Oh yeah, like because I was like I could control it sometimes better. I I could have done this. Yeah. Easier. Like, why don't they have more people? Like, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Control, yeah. Yeah. 100%, yeah. So and and if you run out of avoidance techniques and you run out of control techniques, then there's this absence of trust. Suddenly you find yourself in a position where you don't know who or what to trust. You don't know who or, who or to talk to. You don't know what to share. You don't know where to go. So what happens is, is people shut down. And that's the point that you were getting to, that that being alone. Right. And that's that's when it gets dangerous. That, well, I mean, I think the other two are dangerous, too, if you really, I mean, I, the, the weird thing is, like, I think if you look at the, those certain people, like, I, if we're, like, I'm trying to normalize what we went through, like, to be honest with mm -hmm. you, like, the, the big thing is to pretend like everyone, like, I, not pretend, but a lot of people be like, if you it's like going tit for tat. Like we do that all the time and everything. Like I did this and someone times up the store. Like, don't, don't get me wrong. Like, I mean, there's a police officer, there's a, there's a normal, there's a normal person who's never been in the military, never done anything like that, that has seen the worst trauma that we could ever imagine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and the, the problem is I think with the, with veterans, I feel like we are, we, and I don't want this to come out the wrong way. I might get booed out this, but I feel like we, we want to like, be the the gold winner for a trauma right right yeah and we're not right 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 it, we're not but some of it may have been but there's there's you know everybody like you said 90 percent of the people have seen trauma mm -hmm. that trauma it's it's normal to, to, to do that it's just our reaction to it is 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 is, is gone off the it's gone off the chain to me it's like we yeah. we're we're killing ourselves to an astronomical rate which i don't understand you know what i mean right and right. I don't know if that first thing is the normalization, if that's what really has to happen, is that this is 
it's normal to feel this way. It's normal to feel a lack of trust. It's normal to feel isolated. It's normal to avoid things, right? Right. It's, it's a normal response to an abnormal life circumstance. And, you know, what you're, what you're talking about is telling war stories. That's what you're talking about. And everybody is one-upsmanship. Everyone wants to one-up the next one. And you did this, well, I did that. Well, you did this, well, I did that. And, you know, it, and, and it goes and it goes and it goes. But at the end, everyone telling the story ends up to some degree traumatized or re-traumatized. Because every time you retell the story, you re-traumatize yourself. You, to a degree, relive part of it. But is it re-traumatized? But is that bad, though, in your mind? Depends. Depends upon what it does to you after you tell it. For some people, no, it's not a bad thing. For some people, it's 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 actually a sense of accomplishment. It's a, it's, it's a badge of courage. Um, for other people, depending upon what the trauma was, um, it's, it's the worst thing that can happen to them. And you can tell that person because they, they get real quiet. As soon as that that war story starts happening, the person that is uncomfortable with it is the person that's having trouble. They're the ones that are lost. To go back to Henry David Thoreau, um, you know, it's it's amazing to me that um, what connects some people together will isolate others, and the idea is being aware of that. The idea is tuning into that, seeing that, and understanding that, and and just just saying to the person, yeah, okay, yeah, we we need to back off on this for a minute. We we need to go someplace else. So now you talk about that because you know a lot of you know, the, and I'm glad you brought that up and, and to talk about that because you know war stories are telling people what happened. It's like I'm like I've been I, I've been open here is I don't talk to my family much about mm -hmm. what what i like what i feel is like what i don't want to talk like you know what i mean like what yeah. i what makes me uncomfortable right um so i think it's like i don't know if it's the story but it's the audience sometimes Does that makes sense like yeah so i feel more comfortable like honestly like if 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 you know jason's down here there's veteran there's three veterans down here and three non-veterans right so i feel more comfortable talking to jason and dan than I do other people because we relate, right? They, yeah, they can, shared experience. Yeah, it's, and they and and it's a big part of me is a lot is like when I say that that I'm not being judged, yeah. right? So and I think as a family, you know, as a family member, that's one of the things that you talked about, you know. And I'm glad you brought that up and, and said it that way is like, you know, families want to hear these things. They want to know what's in your head. Yeah, which that person doesn't. Some people will tell them. Like I've heard people. I've had people tell me like, oh my gosh you should tell your family all these things. And I'm just like, no, I yeah. absolutely don't want to yeah. tell my family yeah. anything about that because I don't want the, those are the, the most intimate people to me. I have to see them every day. And I, and I don't want to ever think that they are like, look at me and be like, Holy shit. I can't believe you said that or felt that way. I don't yeah. want to be judged. No, right? it's, and, and there are certain burdens that we don't need to share. And when you're aware of that and you're aware of the burdens that you don't need to share, the reason that you can share them with Jason and other people is because you know they carry that burden. Right. So it's not a risk to share with them. In fact, it's camaraderie. It's support. And that's different than having that conversation with your spouse or your kid. Right, right. Yeah. But, but I felt that same way with, you know, to get into a thing of why I'm excited to have you on is about this is like, I feel that same way when I'm talking to a medical professional. So we, you and I share yeah. a little bit, you know, you have to rewind back and, and, and we don't want to do that in time. But like you think about 2005, 2006, you know, that was still very early in, in you know, two major wars that just ended mm -hmm. the past couple of years. So how people were dealing with when you went and talk to someone in your profession 20 years ago. Yeah how they're Very today, different. right? So I always felt that way too. Like I felt, you know, and we've said this on the podcast before, or I have, and some other guests have as well, but, um, you know, I, I feel that, that, that fear of judgment is what stops me from wh why I said a, a medical professional, like, like, it was funny to hear you to, to open up and be candid about what you've done. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, all of a sudden it, it, it like relaxed me. It, yeah. it relaxed me really quickly. It's like, okay, like, this guy can relate to like he's 
right. You know, he he's been through some some shitty stuff, but I feel like that's the the problem with you know my my own personal thing of why I stay away from like professional help because I've had some people yeah. that when I was when I needed help or I needed to to get it off my chest, I felt like I was being judged. Right. So I've been trying to say like whatever that person is, if it's a a, a medical professional like you, it's your neighbor. Um, you know, Sally or another veteran or your family, you just, you just have to do what's comfortable for you, right? Absolutely. You have to find your safe space within your own skin. You have to know who you can talk to. And, and I will tell you that even today with as much as we've gained and as much as we understand about the trauma experience, there are still some people who just don't get it. There are still some people who don't understand and they will never understand because they've never had the experience. Yeah. And, and, but that's 10%. That's a, that's a small percentage. That's a small people. percent. Yeah. It's a very small percent. But there's 90 who have, right? So, yeah. But the worst thing you're saying in all this is you have to find out who it is, but it's not you keeping this all to yourself, right? That no, it's saying? not. It's not you keeping like, it to yourself. Like you've you've got to find a way to get You talked about the next thing and I, I kind of, hijacked it or that's whatever, all right but like that's so you're right. talking about the next thing is like lack of trust you're in your own head. yeah you're in your own head you don't know who to talk to and and that's that's what you're getting down to is that if you don't know who to talk to and you don't know who to trust well then you've got to find a group of people and that's what i admire about what you're doing you found a group of people you've opened up a channel of communication for a bunch of people that may not otherwise have that channel of communication that's huge that's incredibly important work because if the person doesn't where do they go they shut down they don't have anyone to talk to they don't feel like anyone can relate to them they feel like they're being judged they feel like their people are looking at them in in a way that that maybe they're thinking that they're not safe yeah. you know? and and um you know, I, it's the world that I come from that the words no good still fit very comfortably in front of the word drunk. And I'm part of a small population that can't handle that. Um, but there is a part of the population that still looks upon your experiences as somehow damaging. And it's not the case. It's not the case. They're just your experiences. Right. And when people do that, you tend to shut down because you don't know who to trust or you don't know how it's going to be accepted or you don't know how it's going to be shared. And, and this, this is where it becomes a very slippery slope. And, and you wanted me, you wanted me to talk a little bit about um, suicide. Right. And I really can't talk about that without talking a little bit about anxiety and depression first. Okay. So um, depression and anxiety are, are the strangest things that are life experiences. Anxiety is driven by fear. And typically it's fear of the future, what might go wrong. And, and depression is about the past and guilt. And things not working out the way they did. And, and those are two simple ways of thinking about it. But oftentimes depression manifests itself as anger. It manifests itself as frustration. It manifests itself as distrust. And I think, but in that for veterans, I think you just said some key things to me, the depression, it's like, or the, the things that have the past that happen. That's why I think where you, a lot of us hang out where like we get depressed about when we realize we missed, you know, five birthdays of my yeah. seven year old or yeah. things like that. So that's, that's a key. And I, and I think those two things you talked about are, I feel like the, I had a question here, like what, and I'll, I'll read it maybe later, but it's, I just feel like those two things are like collided with, with, with veterans, right? Because yeah. at the time, what, everything that we were doing at the time, like those things that we missed, like we, most of us didn't give a shit. Like, like we really didn't like, it's so weird to, we did, but we, we didn't like we really yeah. didn't like yeah. We, yeah does that make sense like it makes total sense you know because, where, this because, is where i think we're different between that person that's in a car accident that person that's been subject to you know horrific um you know like w whatever you know what i mean yeah. in life but yeah. that's something like we chose this thing we were like okay you know we were like 
screw that. Like I'm, I was comfortable. Like we could be like in our, like we could be doing our job and it could be our kid's birthday. And we're just like, it's not a big deal. I, I, I called and told him happy birthday. I sent him an email. I did, I did my job. I sent him an email. I, I right. wish him a happy birthday. But you were never more alive when you were doing that job. Right. But that, that, that being more alive ends. Yes. And it, it and, comes and to a screeching you, fucking halt really fast. And there's nothing to replace that with. Whiskey sometimes or other. Or other things. Or, no, other things. Like I've been like, I mean, like we were talking before, you know, like triathlons. And right. Marathons. And whatever. Yeah. yeah, there's that. Yeah. But that I think that's what I, I mean. I'm glad you brought that up. Cause I th- I'm just trying to, not that I don't care about other yeah. demographics or other people, but, you know, I, we, you know, It'll take me my whole lifetime to try to figure out what's going on with veterans. Hopefully, yeah. So that those are the things as a, to hear you say that I think that one thing, the depression, what we have done in the past, where it, it finally catches up with us. I think is it different does. to a lot of people, right? It does. It catches up with you, and the the strange thing about depression is you can see it coming. You can understand what it is. You can understand what it's going to do to you. And you still can't stop it. It was like that Netflix. Have you seen that Netflix? What is it? Loudmouth or whatever? No, I it's like a dep- well, big mouth. Yeah, I always mess up. It's like, there's like a depression kitty. Like whenever like something's happened, there's like an animated like cat that's like depression cat. But you're right. That, that just it, it's, it's funny just that scary. you see that. It's the truth. Like you see it. But we. It's it's interesting because that that's the thing is I I don't I I don't know if we really I don't know if I ever saw it coming until. It came to an end, right? Oh, oh, yeah, and you, Does that make you, sense? yeah, because you're in the midst of it. You in in the midst of it, and you can tell yourself that thought's not accurate. The the you know the the distrust of this person or that place or this thing, the anger that I feel, the frustration that I have, the criticism that I'm giving, that's not me. But you can't stop yourself. And even even though it's there, it's 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 got to go through its course. It's got to go through its course, and understanding that is probably the first step to understanding where the danger begins. So, if you're recommending to a veteran that depression part about things in the past, that depression is what you've done in the past, if you're talking about moving on, right? Mm-hmm. If I'm recommending like you want to move on, what, wh- who, who is that? Like, how, how do you, how do you get through that? Like, you know, do you talk to your kids? Do you tell them you're sorry about missing birthdays? Do you like, like what, what is, what so, is the way to get past that? Because there's some things like uh, there's many times I, people say like, you were just doing your job, right? It's okay that you missed that. And, and most of the time, I think a lot of us go like, we're just getting that, like, you're just getting a pat on the back and being like, yeah. that's great. Right. That's great. Yeah. Right. Like, and, but the, cause the person to me is like, if I tell, if I tell someone who's not, this is, kind of contradicts what I said earlier, but it's like, if, if I tell that story to like someone who's never been in the military, they weren't affected by it. They're just like, you're just doing your job. You're, you're, you're all right. Mm-hmm. But really that, that driving issue of, the, of depression that that's bothering me is you have to go to the source, right? Like if it's, if you're feeling guilty about, abandoning your wife with kids while you deployed or mm-hmm. missing birthdays. Those are the people you have to, you have to seek put, forgiveness from, right? Or you have to put something equally as powerful up against the depression. Ooh, tell me more about that. So what is that thing that's equally as important to you and is equally powerful and you're hitting on it. It's your wife. It's your children. I'm going to pick on Dan because I haven't depressed him for a bit. Um, <laughs> You know, one many many of my best friends, their fathers were uh, professionals, uh, pharmacy physicians, and what have you. And and I was talking to a friend of mine. His his father had passed, and I went, and it was like he had kind of a rocky relationship with your dad. What what was the deal? And he said, my dad was a good physician, and that's the absence that you're talking about. His dad was a good physician, but he was always working, and and. You know, you could say the same thing. Yeah, you were doing your job, right? But but to counteract that depression, you've got to put something equally powerful up against those thoughts to be able to turn those thoughts, to be able to bend that curve of where your mind is going. And you've got to ground yourself in the reality of today that I'm not I'm not doing that job anymore. 
and my job now is here with my family and my job now is whatever my job is. Right. And, and how do you get the importance of that to raise to the level of what you remember about your other job? Because the memory is always going to sound sweeter than the reality of it was. <clears throat> to, me, to me, it's not the job. Like, so I don't chase like the, I chase the adrenaline like in a different way, but I don't, that, that's not what I, I don't, don't wrong. You missed that. But mm -hmm. I'm more stuck in the past of like, for me personally, is like, and I think a lot of us are, is like, I, 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 like you see your sons, like I have three sons, right? Like one mm -hmm. of them, like there's a, there's a, there's a connection that I'm, that I, I don't have. Yeah. Because I was gone. Yeah. Like I can't change that. No, you can't. Right. But in my mind, it just, it just, beats me to fucking death sometimes so the like to evil. some people like it just beats them to death like my like i don't like it and i don't know if it's like a repetitive thing like you're you're stupid but like you just like i'm always constantly like you you, you know that like you you like you no matter what you do no matter how much like how many games i go to if i coach my kids game now like i miss like six years of their life it was pivotal right, right. And, and all the things they do, and, and, like, I think this happens to, like, veterans is, like, all of a sudden, like, they do all these things, and then all of a sudden that, that kid goes back to mom, and they talk to mom about mm -hmm. things that they want to talk to. And and, and I, I'm just throwing some broad things out there, just, like, yeah. I'm yeah. – but so it goes but, back but, to that whole thing of, like, that forget – like, is, is, like, is it really getting that forgiveness from the people that you really hear? Because, like, I don't give a shit about anybody else – during that time frame like my like I, like if i'm being honest with like i don't give a shit about how my dad felt mm -hmm. i don't give a shit about how my mother-in-law felt my father-in-law felt about all that kind of stuff i really still harbor guilt about how my family felt and then how yeah. my kids felt yeah right yeah um and that's like that's hard to to deal with right you know what I mean? that is hard to deal with and and what's the equal and opposite of that for you um and it has to be in the present because the guilt and the depression is in the past and finding a way to let go of the past to enable the energy that you're giving that to be present in your life today. Right. But right? I would argue that a lot of veterans, they can't get the, that's, that's, that's the, the key. hardest thing. That's the, that's hardest the thing, key. Right? Sure. It's the key. It's the hardest thing to do. That's the hard. I think that's the hardest thing. Like the, it's whole, the hardest thing. Like to people do. talk that's about all this kind of shit and energy. To. That's the guilt of like, like, Oh, how do I get myself away from that that seems to be so overwhelmingly powerful? And why am I allowing that to put me in a space where I'm missing the present? Right. And that's, that's the question that you've got to ask yourself. Why is it so important that I'm holding on to that guilt that I'm missing my opportunity at this moment? Well, for me, I would think there's two things. Like there's the person that can deal with it, the individual the veteran, whatever. And then there's the family, right? Yeah. The family still wants you to say, like, if my wife still wants me to say at the time that happened, would I change anything? The answer is no. No. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. No. No. I would no. But then you're like, the answer should be when you say that should be, of course, if I could go back in time, I would change everything, right? And that's what a lot of us are like. The answer is no. So we, I feel like it's a weird. Well, well, the answer is no because you can't, unless you've got a time machine. Yeah, but if you ask somewhere. somebody, like I think a lot of times when you're talking to someone, and maybe if I'm wrong about, like, mm -hmm. if, would you have handled some situation differently? Most people will be like, always. I thought about it, and would I have told you to fuck yourself? No. For, like yeah. a lot of people will be like, yeah. some people will be like, I thought about this deep down inside, and I would not change my reaction to you ever. Right. So like the things that we've done, I think if you ask a lot of us mm -hmm. to do that, I don't think any of us would be like, no, I wish I was here or there. I wish I didn't deploy. And right. a lot of times, as we've seen some veterans who haven't deployed, they were the ones that were wanting to deploy. And they're feeling yeah. they're feeling the, a complete whacked out different view. Different of view. Of, yeah, absolutely. They are. That's about the then and the why. OK. The, the question is answered by focusing on the now and the how. The, the then and the why, you may or may not have wanted to change it. And the then and the why might lead you to some better understanding of it, but it's the now and the how that makes a difference going forward. 
it's the now and the how that makes all of the connections happen going forward. It's the now and the how that has you sitting at this table talking to me because you know this is making a difference. You know you're contributing something. Or at least you hope it is. No, I, I, I mean, there's there's no doubt. I mean, and I'm not trying to focus just on me because, like, I don't – <laughs> This could be a, a, a twenty-seven hour episode, but I'm, I'm trying to be more of like <laughs> I don't have that much. No, no, time. no you're no, we're, we're talking about. But I'm just trying to draw. And when I'm saying a lot of these things too, I mean, okay, I'm trying to like we talked about this before. Like I've done a lot. This is this is the hardest episode I've ever done because there's a lot of research that goes into it. I'm yeah. trying to like yeah understand yeah. the, the. But you're right. Like that whole thing of like, do you make a difference now? How do you make a difference now in your life? Right. You know, there's no doubt for me. Like you know, not everybody has the opportunity. Um, you know, the social connection to do what, to, to decide what I did to do a year ago. That mm -hmm. doesn't make me any better than anybody else. It doesn't anything else. It's just, it's, it's completely crazy. If you talk to people, I talked about doing this in April last year, yeah. people thought it was crazy. People still think I'm crazy, which is fine. But that, the, 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 the find the connection now, it could be like going to every soccer game, right? Yeah. Being, being present involved now. Like, yeah. You know I mean, being there now, which you talked about before, like that, that veteran feels bad. They've self-isolated themselves. Now they're like, I've done all these things. I missed seven birthdays. What the fuck does one more birthday mean, right? Right. That's that's the wrong way to go. Right. The the right way to go is I'm going to be there from now on. I'm going to offer it, but I don't. I the other piece that gets people in trouble is I'm not going to have any expectations of what I get back from it. Can you allude more on that? Yeah. A lot of people get let down by their expectations. They they build it up in their mind. If I'm at the track meet or I'm at the game, I'm at the ball game and I'm there, uh, this is going to make everything okay. This is going to have exactly the right Billy's going to forget about those 15 years. That, I that's not going to, you know, those, and, and we know those are not rational, but those are the kind of things we tell ourselves. And and it's it's the expectations we have that set us up to fail. Our expectations, when our expectations are higher of our family members, the farther we have to fall when our family members don't meet the expectations that we've kind of fantasized in our mind. Right. You know, it's kind of like going out looking for that perfect Christmas gift. Which never exists, right? Which doesn't exist, but you build up in your mind that I've got the perfect gift. This is the perfect thing, and this is going to be the reaction. And the gift is opened, and that's not the reaction, and all of the air comes out of your sails. You're pissed, you're like, no, it's, and this is why I'm excited to have you on because I think you're now putting, you know, a lot of years of experience behind it, which I think is important. And and you know, for me, like a lot of things I'm talking about before, like some things I'm telling you are. You know, everything I'm telling you is like a personal feeling, but it's also these things are, it's funny to hear you talk about these now. And like, it, it just, it's simple, right? Yeah. It really, to me, it it's really kind, is. Simple. It kind of is a simple thing, right? Yeah. It's the hardest you, simple thing ever. Hardest simple thing ever. Yep. A, it's the you hardest. Say it with such a straight face. You're like, yeah, I'm dead serious. It's the hardest simple thing you'll ever do. Right. Right. Because the thing you say, and I hope everyone's listening, is like if you're really being honest with yourself, I felt the same way as I was like, I I was here for the birthday, that makes up for six birthdays, right? Yeah, at least um, your expectation is. Well, I think we really think that. Like we went to, like I did three in a row. Yeah, that makes up for six. Yeah, and I, but you're right. I think really under having a real for a second, but I think that, so the thing that's interesting, everything we're talking about, we're talking about that individual, we're talking about an individual that's been through trauma, that veteran, that police officer, whatever. Like, I think the other part about this is, and it's not to shift blame on anybody else, but there's that other, like the other part of it is the family that they're together, right? The children. Yeah. I think it's, there's an education that they have to have to understand that too. Right. There is like, there's a huge Absolutely. thing of like, cause I'm a big person. Like I make a dinner, like, I make dinner for my family, to be honest with you. Like I do it most of the time, but I'm like, when I make a dinner, I, if the kids around, I'd like, give me a grade on dinner. And like, I, like you have your different kids are like 9.1. And then like, I have one that's like, that's a six. And you're just like, <laughs> what do you mean it's a six? And like, it will literally put you into a, a tailspin. A, a tailspin. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and it's like, and I'm just like, what's it? And like, and he'll be, and we all know who it is. It's Nate. 
um, um, if we're talking about it. And, and just be like, you know, I've had better meatballs. You're like, who's yeah. where's meatballs? You know, it, it's just like, <laughs> but I think that's I, and, and not to and I I never absolutely like I absolutely never want to put it on because we're, we're we're I think we're gearing towards what all this stuff leads to, which is an astronomical amount of veterans committing suicide, yeah. which is where we're going to get to hopefully. Yep. yep. And I think we're leading that way. It's like I do not. I absolutely like drawing the line. I'm saying that's not the family's fault when the person quits suicide, that individuals. But I think these things you're saying, if you're a veteran, I hope you're listening. If you're a family member, I hope you're listening to what Ken is saying, because that maybe makes you understand why that, you know, your loved one who's, who's a veteran gets all pissed off that. Yeah. And, and is, you know, has these high expectations, you know what I mean? Yep. Is, the and, expect- and does that make sense? The expectations no? live in your mind and you set the expectations really high. And and when Nate tells you that meatball's a six, yeah, man. Do I want to punch him in the face? Yes. Oh, no, okay. God. All of the time I put into making those meatballs, and I went out and I picked this stuff up. And, the meatball yeah, okay. <laughs> now the no, no. truth comes out. Yeah, yeah. No, but you know what I mean? It's it's a, but I, we, but it's funny. So, and I, I, that's why I'm bringing it up because I think it's all together. Like when he says that, I'm making a joke, but it's really like, it, it's crazy how much it can affect my. It could change. It your changes mood. the whole mood of the whole. Everything. Right. Yeah. Your your great day goes to hell in a handbasket, and and you don't really understand why, and you know really there's a complex neurochemical process going on in your brain, with dopamine and all the neurotransmitters, serotonin and norepinephrine. And the dopamine is what makes you feel good. You see the doctors back there. Like, and, and everyone else was just like, what the, what the, what the f- is he talking about? Yeah. You know, dopamine <laughs> like, the feel good neurotransmitter and, and, and norepinephrine like the energy one and, and serotonin's the, <laughs> the, you know, kind of the, the like mood elevator and all I'm of this. Uh-huh. But, but when your expectations are dashed, your, your dopamine level crashes. And I've never met a person that said, well, now I'm in a bad mood because my dopamine just crashed. You don't <laughs> think that way, right? There's there's a physiologic process going on that you don't have access to. If I were to ask you right now, how's your pancreas doing? Can you answer the question? How's your liver? How's your pancreas? My liver is... How's your hippocampus? Is, <laughs> you know, is, is, is your brain stem still working? Are you still breathing? There's this autonomic nervous I'm system. I'm attack right now. My kidney is feeling attacked right now. Oh <laughs> no, I hope not. <laughs> yeah. So you know, there there are all these things going on, and and you don't even realize it. You know, you, right. your your body is telling you to blink your eyes, and just because I said blink your eyes, now you're trying to resist blinking your eyes because I planted that seed. And and the idea of it is is that your autonomic nervous system is what keeps you alive, but it also does things to you that you don't understand like changes your mood. There's a word for it. It's called emotional augmentation. It's it's being instantly pissed off for absolutely no reason. Yeah, Jan, I hear that. There you go. <laughs> I'm getting that. There you go. It's it's and it's a 25 cent term for instantly pissed off for absolutely no reason. So to go back to what we're talking like I think it's because we're gearing on veterans is I feel like the things you're I uh, th- we talked about depression. We talked about the what is it, the no and what is it what's the, the now and the now versus now and now. the then. And I think the we're all most of us are trying to fix that. Yeah, right? yeah. And then the, you you make a dinner for your kid and he tells you it's a six meatball. Yeah, and it's just like spirals. Like then you like you're like I got kicked in the teeth. I'm ready to go. Like next thing is a vacation, right? We go on a vacation. Go on vacation. You're like this is the best vacation. This is the best vacation I ever had in my entire life. Yeah, and you take him there, and your kid's like. I'm bored. Yeah. So I think, I, I don't know if it's like that. I, I personally, for me, I, I'm speaking for myself here. And I think I speak for a lot of veterans is we are trying to make up for the past within that. Yeah. But we run into the things you're talking about, like that. The expectations. These crazy expectations. Like I'm going to Disney World. I'm going to spend $10,000. It's the best thing ever. And then like, and then it stop. doesn't happen. And then we just like, we like. You crash. Right. And And it takes you back to the then and the why. Man, this is deep. This is deep. I like it. Yeah. This is this is the place where most people get stuck. But you always go back, right? Yeah, you well, you go back because it's what you know best. You don't know the future at all. So it's easy to go not back. There. Future doesn't count. 
You don't know what it is. You don't know how to handle it. You don't know what to expect. So you always go back. But the past happened. That counts, right? The past happened. The past happened. So it's what you relate to. And and that's the mistake that most people who are experiencing trauma live in. They're always going backwards trying to figure out how, how do I change this? Now, I, could, I, I do a lot of work with people around that. And I do a lot of work with people about how to change their expectations and how they think about things. Because honestly, all of the things that we're talking about are all the things that have been developing throughout your lifetime. And I could predict, actually, you will tell me how to predict how you're going to respond to any given situation. Really simple assignment that you or anyone listening can do. Take a piece of paper, divide the piece of paper. Everybody listen, like this is listening for real. Take a piece of paper, divide the piece of paper in half. Put your positive life experiences at the top of the paper. Put your negative life experiences at the bottom of the paper. Okay. Now you might have to have a really long piece of paper to get this done. From like a butcher block, memory to just make the TV fold in half. Like, that's yeah, yeah, that's a big. That might work. <laughs> then go back to each experience that you put down, and write down how you reacted to it, the good and the bad. And then go back and look at it and see if there's any patterns. And I promise you, before you put down half of how you've reacted over the past things to both the good and the bad, you're going to see patterns that start to develop. And those patterns that develop are the patterns that are going to continue in your life unless you change them. Are you talking to me or everybody? Like, everybody. Like, <laughs> everybody. I feel very targeted right there. I'm like, oh the, the thing in psych- Yeah, like well, you're, you're okay. the person no. I'm talking to, I'm but like, I, I forget I'm talking I to a lot a of people. I feel a ton of there. pressure right now. But no, no, yeah. no I, it's, it's the truth. I think there's... And uh, in, in working but in the, psych- But that back and forth, like, I I think that's the truth. Is like, I, my, I think I said this before. If I haven't, it, it's fine, but I've said it out loud in, in other forms, but... What gets me the most mad is I I don't need that piece of paper right like I know like you know. I know yep. I know what's gonna happen like so I know I know I'm gonna do something like you know what I'm I come down here like in the basement and I'm like what I just said or did upstairs is wrong mm-hmm. I said I shouldn't have said that you're better than that like be in the now you can do this and I'll just be like. That is never going to happen again. Right. Right. And then literally 27 minutes later, it happens. I do the same thing. Yeah. Okay. And then I like, and I think, and I'm, I'm, I'm being honest with, and I, I, and I, I think there's part of me, like, I feel funny about this, but I don't is I'm, I've been, I'm, I, I don't think I'm very different. I'm, I'm different from other people. I'm the same. I feel the same way. Like yeah. it's, it's, that's what, that's what hurts me the most. Like I yeah. know what I did is wrong. I know, how what I said to a friend or how I ended a situation is completely wrong, right? And, and that, I know better than that. And, and like, and everything in my mind is like, I'm going to be better. I'm going to do this. I could write it down. I could like look at a quote like you and just be like, I'm going to read this. I feel good about myself. And then like 20, like it's like SpongeBob five minutes later. Like I just yeah. <laughs> go completely batshit crazy. Over well, the same thing. you and everyone else in the world, because everybody does this. Okay. You know, let, let me take it down to the simplest terms. You probably heard something from your parents that you said that you would never say as a parent. And then you said it. I'm going to give you something to cry about. I have never said that. Actually. Okay. That, that was my example. So that was my example. So I, I've done some things where like, if you're, but I, I'm glad you said what you said before. It's like, that is normal. Like, yeah. That, and why I bring this up in mind being honest with like, I'm like, I feel like I'm on an open forum and it's fine. But that is the key is like, I, I, I sometimes like want to be this big, bad person. Like I'm the only person that feels that way. I'm the only person that does that. And I'm really not. No. Every, everybody fucking does that. Everybody does that. Right. Like, and and everybody so a, is disappointed in themselves for doing it. And everybody kicks themselves in the ass for doing it. And this is where we get to the stuff that just sucks the fun right the fuck out of the room. Cool. This is and and it's that when you are living with that 
expectation that is high and you do something that dashes that expectation and then you say something or do something that further complicates the situation and you are harder on yourself than you would ever be on another human being and you beat yourself up over it which i think ties into i'm glad you brought this up i think it's a scripted in some ways huh imagine that it's not <laughs> you're his well, first patient jack <laughs> i'm not his first patient. Huh. No, what i mean by that is i what, what i would say to that is and I'm speaking for veterans. I feel like we talked about that badge of courage. Like the, we we hold ourselves to a different standard, right? Like, uh-huh. like we, failure is we not are an supposed option. to be like better than everyone else, right? Like that's yeah. the whole thing you talk about. These things, like man, that fucking cop, whatever, dude. We're 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 better than the cop. Like we like whatever. We, I had a better ASVAB score, or whatever. Like you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But I feel like those things you're talking about. We we hold we hold ourselves. We we won't give up. We won't. We hold ourselves to such a high standard because that's what we're supposed to do. Right. But that standard is kind of, it's a, it's a false standard, right? It's, it's not it a is. reality. It is. Right. And then some people never forget about that. Like, this is what I should do. Like, I shouldn't be the person I should never show weakness. Like I should never be scared. Like I will tell anybody that's done, like anybody we talked about, like my history, like jumping out of airplane, if you've jumped out of airplane and you say you're not scared, you're a fucking liar. Right. Like, I mean, there, there's nothing, there's nothing about that. Like whatever you want to build up and tell people like, I'd be scared. I was scared every time. Mm-hmm. However, the military, and I think there's, the, the, you talked about doctors, right? The same thing. Like a doctor, yeah. like when someone tells you you're a doctor, there's a level of professionalism, of yeah. all these kind of things. So like those things are, are they real? Is that level of the, like we're talking about the military, is that level of expectation or standards or morals or, or should ours be any higher than everybody else's? No, right? No, they should not. They should not. And, and physicians, much like veterans, have imposter syndrome where, where they feel like they, they shouldn't have been able to do what they did or they shouldn't be able to do what they're doing. Um, they feel not like Dan, he's over there eating a cookie. He's like, well, I'm not yeah, good. Just... yeah, well, he's, he's, that's his different standards. <laughs> he's got altogether. his legs crossed over. He's like, you know, but you're, you're in your, you your world said failure is not an option. And the physician's world says failure is not an option, but there's a difference is that they always look at things from the worst possible outcome so that they can prevent it from happening. You're looking at it from how do I create a situation where we don't have to face that worst possible outcome. Um, but yet when, when you're back, when you're with your family, your expectation is to then make it so that it's like nothing ever changed. Nothing ever happened. You were never gone. That's Everything's what exactly see. what it is. That's what I think is that's, that's why I said scripted. It's like, you're almost like it's, this is what, that's what I'm talking about. That, that I think that is what our like. I, I had a question. It was like, and we're going towards that. It was. It was um, let me find it. It said, in your personal and or professional opinion, what do you think is the cause or causes of su- the suicide epidemic we are seeing with veterans? Mm-hmm. Is there any other demographic or error that you know where we are seeing such a high number of suicides? Suicide. And that's one of the things I talked about. Is like it, that's what leads to because all these things you were talking about, this like yeah. loneliness, this isolation, like this disappointment of the now, right? Yeah. Or this this uh, unrealistic image of the now, right? Like, yes. Like, this like you have to be really like when you say like I just been to three soccer games, like three soccer games, and your wife says to you, "Dude, you miss seven hundred and twelve soccer games." Right. You have to be like. You're right. <laughs> You're right. 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 But yeah. that that's the thing in our mind. I think we don't we we think three outweighs seven hundred and twelve, right? There's there's that disconnect. But can it though? It depends upon the circumstance and the situation. If if in those three games and they were three really tough games and you were there to support your kid through those really tough games and you did it exactly right, then that means more than anything. Period. 
It, it does it make up for the other seven hundred? It could. Most likely not. But most likely not. And that your expectation is that I did it exactly right, so it should. But but in your mind, you're talking to yourself with these manufactured memories and you're saying, oh, well, I should have done this or I should have done that or it's all my fault or if I'd only. And those those are things you can't change. Those are manufactured memories. But do you think the, the veteran, because this is what we're talking about, do you think the veteran demographic Mm-hmm. is thinking that more than any other demographic. Absolutely. So what is your reason why you think that is? What is your... Because the expectations combined with the experiences lead to a higher prevalence of a mood crash. And when we talked about that pathway from hypervigilance to avoidance, to control, to trust, to shutting down. Shutting down is is part of the suicide epidemic. Because when people shut down, that's when we're at greatest So what are the risk. symptoms of shutting down? That's important. What is what like what do you I think the so, first stage is like before is like we want to catch people in isolation, right? Yeah, you want to catch folks in isolation. So what's the what's the like before we get to like shutting down, what are the symptoms like if we're talking to people like or if people are listening, if you're in isolation, what are what is that person doing? What is that veteran so doing? That nothing. They don't want to go anywhere. They don't want to talk to anyone. They don't want to leave their house. They don't want to socialize. They don't want to catch up with anybody. They just want to be left alone. That's that's the shutting down. That's the beginning of the shutting down. Now, so I would I will tell you a, a more personal experience because I want this. This is what I'm trying to do here is my mom passed away from cancer, right? Mm-hmm. And my kids were young and. Um, we went back on a holiday. I was living in Texas. My wife, my, my mom was living in New York. We went back there and for like three days, we just like every day brought the kids to see my mom. Like my mom, a lot of people didn't realize my mom was dying of cancer. My mom did, um, <laughs> which is, I, I love her and it, it's, it's a deep thing, but like th- there's people in my family that thought my mom was going to leave the hospital. Mm-hmm. Like my mom knew she was never leaving the hospital. Right. So for three days, we're bringing them there we're on a vacation. And and my mom at a certain point said, like, I, were gonna, I said, we'll see you tomorrow. And she said, do not bring, do not bring them back. Okay. Right. Yeah. Don't come back. I don't want to see the grandkids again. Like they, they, it was nice weather. They took them out. She, they were, she felt good. And, and what you said before was that was like, that was her shutting down. Like she knew yeah. she was going to die. She knew. Like it wasn't her choice to die, but she knew. Right. That, that, so that, that's why I talk about that isolate or that shut yeah. the yeah. the shutting down. It's the same thing. If you see someone that's like they don't want to talk to their like, hey, your granddaughter or grandson's on the phone. I don't want to talk to them. Right. So, so there's, there's realistic things that like right. Or so no? there's this belief in the mind of a person, and, and and I don't think it's always connected to the idea of self harm, but there's the belief that if I distance myself from you, I'll hurt you less. Right. Um, or I read in a book, like, like I'm saying goodbye, like my mom somehow said goodbye to the kids. In yeah. Her mind, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and she probably in her mind thought I can't do that any better than we just do it, did it. So let's leave it as it is because Tomorrow I might not be in good enough shape. But back to, to someone who's going to hurt themselves, like so. It's yeah. a, it's a we have a we have a, a Super Bowl party. Everything feels good. Yep. Everyone's here. I'm contemplating suicide mm-hmm. or thinking about it. I've said goodbye to everybody. Right? So it's kind of the same thing or no? Um, can Think be isolated or no? Can be, but more often than not, it's isolating. Yeah, so person, they're not even having the Super Bowl party. They, yeah. They 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 could they could be at a party in a room full of people and be absolutely alone. To explain that to someone, like what does absolutely alone in the room mean? Like if you're so not if you're the person watching, I think a lot of yeah. it is like that per, the, the person of I don't know if there's a self-awareness at that point. We we all have a self-awareness of what we're doing, but if I'm watching someone, if I'm you know, there's 10 people down here. Who do I have to worry about? What are their? Yeah, what are you, their you're not going to see. 
you're not going to see. Suicide is like a pawn in a chess game. Once it's put in motion, it's always in motion. And the person in the room at the Super Bowl party that's thinking about harming themselves, you're thinking about it at this level, and they're thinking about it way up here. And they're parallel paths. They're never going to cross. That's why you can't predict it. There's no way to predict suicide. Right. There's no scale that we use in psychiatry. We use suicide risk scales all the time. But none of those scales are predictive of who will harm themselves. There's a great book by a guy by the name of Kevin Hines called uh, Cracked But Not Broken. And Kevin Hines is one of a handful of people who jumped from the Golden Gate Bridge in a suicide attempt. And survived. And survived. And, and Kevin, I had dinner with Kevin. We brought him to speak at the university. And he told me a story, and I, I admit that I didn't have time to read the book before we had our dinner together. So I just asked him to tell me the, the crux of the story. He said, you know, I... Yeah, I, I was on the Golden Gate Bridge, and I jumped off, and I survived. I, 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 was, I was isolating from everyone, <laughs> and I promised myself that I'd walk from my house that was about six miles to the Golden Gate Bridge. And, and if anybody asked me if I was okay, I'd tell them no, I wasn't, and ask him to get me help. He encountered six people on the way, two asking for directions, the other four asking to have their pictures taken. Nobody asked him if he was okay. So he was crying, tearful, all the way through. Got to the bridge, at the center of the bridge, leaned over. He got down on the, the mechanicals. The reason that people jump off the Golden Gate is the railing's only three feet high, where the Bay Bridge is like six and a half, seven feet high. So it's really easy to get over the edge to, to jump. He said he was standing on the uh, communication conduits and he leaned back and he let go. And he said, instantly in my mind, I realized everything in my life was ultimately repairable. Except for the fact that I just jumped from off the bridge. Yeah. 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 About 45 miles an hour, his body hits the water, which is kind of like hitting concrete. And he didn't understand how he survived because most jumpers from the bridge breaks, you know, legs, pelvis, everything. He sank to the bottom. It wasn't until he met a trooper that was the second on the scene that told him that his, his sea lions were playing with his body and keeping his body afloat. And that's how he survived. But in his mind, he was distancing from people. Nobody knew, but he was distancing. And in part of that, he was interacting with people in a way that made him think that everything was fine because people are down here and he's way up here. Right, right. Yeah. You know, and, and again, it's a pawn. Once you put that in play, it never comes out of play. Yeah, but the, the, go back to what you were saying if I was challenging because I, I just always want to be me. But that if, if I'm walking, I'm going to commit suicide, right? And I'm like, if someone were asked me how it is, that's kind of putting the onus on someone else, right? It is, do, I mean, if you met him, I haven't met him, yeah. but if somebody would have said, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. What he most likely as you're in your clinic, like you've been doing this for 20 some years, what he yep. most likely have, if he's in yep. this plane with that one conversation of like, how are you doing? And this, is he going to yeah. spill the beans? Yeah, he would. He, what, you think he would? Yeah, have? I would. Because people who are suicidal are ambivalent about that decision. Right. So they play games in their head, much like all of us do. Um, if somebody asks me this, then I'll tell them the truth. And and that's the ambivalence. There was a, there was a young person. And, I'm, um, and I, I hope I, I, I thought you would answer that question the way you did. And that's why I asked it. It's yeah. like that is the it's a key thing of what it really means is like people, they are asking, they are asking for help for real. Like there's yeah, like, for sometimes, real. like some people, they're not joking. it's a joke. Yeah. It's a joke. Like no, they're, people, they're, think they're, no, people think it's a joke. Like there's that, like yeah. no. that person that, that called you, they are really, you could be the last person. And we've talked about this before. You could be that, like that, that walk, that six people, you could be the, the you could be the fifth one, the, the fifth one that, or the first it, one that makes right, a that difference. Yeah. That, and that's what we talked about before. And, and, and the reality of it is, is there's a person who ends their life by suicide every 10.3 seconds in the United States. So I don't know how long we've been talking, but if it's an hour and 23 minutes and 57, 58. No, okay. okay really so, good. you know, you divide that by 10 minutes. Yeah. You know, Every, 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 you divide that out every 10.3 minutes somebody's died in the time that we've been talking and if 
they had the ambivalence, as most of us do. And somebody truly, sincerely asks, will you let me help you? The answer is almost always going to be yes. And the funny thing is, not funny, aha, uh, funny, odd, is that people who are planning to end their lives don't have a plan B. They don't have a plan A. So if you can put out a speed bump that thwarts plan A, they don't have a plan B. They're like, oh shit, this you just... Oh, you just you just blew my fucking mind. I don't have a plan B. I'm sorry. And and I've had patients over the year. I had a guy bring in, you know, the 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 wire rope, you know, that that you use to string off like things or using cables to lift stuff and stuff. He brought that with a couple of U clips into my office. It was a perfect noose, and he threw it on my desk. And he said, "I better give this to you. If not, I'm going to use it." Because we talked about, you know, how, how would you do it? And he said, I, w- I, I would hang myself. And it's like, okay, what's your plan B? What, what do you mean plan B? I don't have a plan B. Should I have a plan B? I don't B? have a car. I don't have a gun. I don't <laughs> yeah, right, right. So, you know. He, and I'm he, not laughing. I think but, it's, it's, but he brought it in and he said, he said, I, I don't want to do this. I, I, I don't want to. I have a grandson that's counting on me. I don't want to do this. I got to give this to you. Now, that didn't mean he wasn't combative when I got him to the emergency room. That doesn't mean he didn't threaten to kick the ass of the security guard. And he's former special forces. And I knew better that that security guard was going to get his ass kicked if he tried. So, um, you know, those are the things you figure out along the way. But I think the important thing to notice is that there are people all around us every single day who have that pawn in motion and they're playing I've, I've never thought game. about it that way. Like I, I'm, I'm a big person. Like, you know, when you, if you, if you walk into a grocery store and you, you see someone, they make eye contact with you, like, good afternoon. In today's world, a lot of people don't even, don't even do that. They don't even, they're like, they act like, like even, in, even in the business world, like you see some, yeah. you know, where I work, they're like, how you doing today? And they just like, they act like you don't hear it. Like for me, what I do is I know you, you you're on like a schedule. I just find you later and just keep asking you for like <laughs> seven or eight times. But no, I mean, which isn't right. But the, the question is like when people ask, like, how are you doing? Right. Uh-huh. Um, there's a guy that checks in the gate where we do like ask, like I say, how are you doing this morning? And he will like, I've sat there for three and a half minutes and tell him about whatever story he's not doing. What I'm like, dude, that sucks. But like, you know what I mean? Or like, it, I, I, that question I asked you was like, I think that we're, that, that you, you talked about the plane, I think, but that, that the guy you talked about, I really believe that they're looking for something to be different. That's what we talked about before is like, the, the, you know, we're trying to find what our hashtag is that pours with Patriots, like to be mm-hmm. there to like, to listen. That's the whole thing is it's like, it, it's, it's a weird thing. I think it's just a, they're really reaching out. They don't want to do this, right? Yeah, you want to be. They have the to head. know it's wrong. Like they have to know it's wrong, right? They do, but in their in their own mind, they're struggling with what do you do with it? Yeah, somebody has to care. Like they have to. Some some somebody's got somebody's got. And it may not be that. your wife because your wife may be the person that's causing you the problem, right? Well, it could or your be your kid. Be, be you know, there's yeah. a different like that's uh... the 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 fix comes from the strangest places sometimes. But, you know, if, if you're struggling for a hashtag, you, you want to be the hand that's there when somebody else reaches out for you. Which I think is important. And that's what I said before, like to be there, like reach out. There's that, some things we're doing. I, I think the biggest, like, the hardest thing about this whole, this, this situation is, is in my mind, like having you on, I was hoping you would have a magic pill. Yeah, we could like, uh, like here's the red pill, the the yellow pill. Ken's gonna give us a red pill, and we'll and it'll end it all. It'll you know all I mean? it'll all go, go away. away. Yeah, right. right. And and it's like uh, it's like the song, the ones then the pills that mother gives you don't do anything at all, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jefferson Starship, I think. The, the, he was listening to the some hardcore stuff. White Rabbit. Yeah, like, there you oh, go. Look at they're all like it's bonding over there. Like, yeah, it's a good song. No, it's true, and that, that's why I've been like super excited about having you on about about talking about. I don't want the, the hard words to say like the 
the cl- I don't like the clinical part. Like I'm not a clinical guy. Like I just like, right. like I could tell you right like right now. Um, I'm happy that you came on for my for the reason of what we're doing with the group. Also with the professional part of the personal part for me is like now, like that like I'm like holy cow this there's people out there that get it like you know what I mean I've labeled your your profession as people that they don't understand what we're doing like and it, right. that's that's apparent that they do it, it may that person you reach out to may not be the right person you know what I mean but if, anybody that's contemplating suicide we've talked about this before it's it's the worst decision I think it's, it's out it's, there um, it's a permanent solution to a temporary issue you think it's all temporary everything though yeah I do okay I do. I, I think Kevin said it best. Everything in his life was ultimately fixable, except for the fact that he just jumped from the bridge. Um, and there's there's solid research. That's a simple way to think about that. Yeah, it's the it's the hardest, simplest thing you'll ever do. The um, there's really good research out there about people who have attempted with a serious suicide attempt to end their lives don't attempt again because they understand that. So that yeah, so like like what is is there a stat on that? Like yeah, yeah, there's a there's a good stat that it's, so the it, people like is there a stat of like I try to commit suicide, mm-hmm. I try to hang myself, it doesn't mm-hmm. work. I tried to hang myself, it and, it, and 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 it and I I realized the through breath. the process <laughs> of it that for whatever reason I didn't die, and I and I realized that that wasn't the answer, and they and they don't attempt again, and it's in the seventy percentile. 70% of people who do this. Now, there, there are another... So 30, what about the 30th percent? That's what Well, that right. other 30% are so severely depressed and they don't have the coping skills, they don't have the mechanisms that that they they go until they get it right. So what are those coping mechanisms you talked about earlier? Yeah, that's or that's the, where we're going like, to... Let's what, what are the... Like, how do you... like? So first off, how do you find those or what are they? Because I I feel that's a part of like they you you try to hang yourself. It doesn't work. They take some self-reflection and realize it's a bad idea. But then that person that does it, 30 percent does it again. And you hear that a lot. Like the the funny thing is a friend of mine's a friend of mine's son committed suicide just recently. and, And I found out, you know, from other people, he didn't share that with me, but they that was not his first attempt. So right, that's not a normal right. thing. That's um, that is that it's thirty percent people. It's thirty percent. So, yeah, so what so is what 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 are those coping when that happens when you do that? Most so, people are shocked into not doing it. What is what are those other people still missing? Well, the what the other people are missing is connection. And and what they're telling themselves is that it's untenable. They can't fix it. There, nobody will understand. Nope, nobody gets me. Um, you hear that a lot in your veteran population. Nobody understands. Nobody gets me. And you, we we are a small population, though. You, right? Yeah, you are. Which a small is what population. you talked about. It is like I get it, but but we have a lot of things similar to other people, right? We have absolutely, absolutely. You struggle with all the same things, just coming from a different perspective. It's it, it's it's. It's the exact same thing, but from a different life experience. And the things that you know will support you and get you back as a veteran are the same things that will keep you going. It's the connectedness. It's the power of the group, not of the individual. So connection, what is connection to you? What does that mean? So connection to you is having at least one to two people that you can call at three in the morning if you need to call them and not hesitate to do so. And they don't, they're not, they don't later on, two hours later, tell other people that they called them at three o'clock in the morning and give you yep. a hard time. I'm looking at Jason. There. I'm joking. No, no, I'm making a joke. About it. But no, that, and this is the things we're talking about. It's like, that yep. is the thing of. You got to, do you have a 3 a.m. friend? You can call that's not going to judge you, that's going to take the call that's willing to listen to you for an hour. <laughs> Everyone's like, that motherfucker's calling me. I never called any of you guys at 3 o'clock in the morning. Let's be clear. Yet, right? That's not true. I have but, actually but, one of the people I've called through that one. Um, but um, no, that's, that's true. But that's the thing of. That's. 
That's how we all have that, right? Though I think we all have that. I not or not my being. I think we all have it, but I think that there are times we're not all convinced that we should make that call, or that we should bother that person. You always should make that call. But you should always make that call. If you're thinking you need to make that call and you're telling yourself you don't, you're lying to yourself. Like there's the people in this room that I've told I love you more than I've probably told my kids. Yeah. So and 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 it's funny. I feel bad about it, but there's sometimes it's just like it's I, the connectedness. I, I love them. Like there's just like it's like it is a person that. But I think we all have it. You just have to you have to reach out, right? You have to find well, the person. I, I don't do we... know. I don't know that we all have it. Shit, you just totally changed the script on it. No, um... <laughs> yeah, I, I I think that there are people who convince themselves that they don't have it. Um I will be anybody's 3 a.m. in morning call. There you go. I, I honestly believe that. And these guys know that it's like I've it just takes it... That's the point, is that any of you would be willing to be the 3 a.m. phone call taker. Right. What you what what we have to do is to convince that small group of people out there that it's okay to call us. That you'd rather So what do you think is stopping that? What's your they don't want to be a burden. They don't want to wake you up. They know you've got things to do. You've got to get up. I'm not going to call him. He's, 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 what's he going to think about me? Is he going to think I'm weak? Is he going to think I, 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 I'm useless? You know, and, and you know, there is still a stigma that's alive and well. My parents, when I was growing up, used to talk about cancer and mental illness in a hushed voice. And if my parents were still alive, they'd still be talking about mental illness in a hushed voice. We will not overcome the suicide epidemic that we're facing until we have a mental health hospital the size of the James Cancer Hospital. Amen to that. That's we will the- not overcome what we're facing in the suicide epidemic until we have one month follow-ups with our patients after their treatment for the first year of their treatment. And then we have quarterly follow-ups with them for the next five years, like we do cancer patients and heart patients. No, that's like, we, we, I, I can't go and ask some stuff. We talk about, we don't get into politics and stuff, which is, but I, I firmly believe there's a lot of things that happen in our country where mental health, hospitals disappeared and we're not getting to that but i i agree with you like when i drive by the osu where my son works i'm like look at that fucking place like yeah they're 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 fucking they can like my son we just met him he, they're on a ward where they freaking take organs out of people's bodies and transplant ward like i yeah. mean we got to do something better for people that are suffering from mental illness right um, and that whole place should be like and, and, and with us like veterans aren't different um, than anybody else because we do we do suffer trauma like we said before mm-hmm. but that whole thing about getting back and like there has to be a the thing you talked about it went back you said before that that to be the burden or to be made fun of it's just like the the veterans are we're causing this for ourselves i said this earlier about an hour ago is like we will we constantly are like checking ourselves like and the, a lot of it is a joke but a lot of it, most of it's a joke, but a lot of it isn't. Like, so, like, someone's like, you know, if I was in the seventh special forces group and I had five deployments and I don't get any money from the VA, and then somebody's like, okay, I, you know, this happened to me and I was in whatever and I have PTSD, the veterans, we're, we're, we're putting that burden on ourselves. We're saying that person's like, like that person's a pussy. Like, the, 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 she's like, 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 they didn't do any shit. Like, that's what I talk about. This wife said this podcast is like, yeah. you know, like Jocko. Like, I listen to Jocko all the time. Like, we talk about like Jocko's and like he's talking about stuff like 1% of 1% can relate to him, right? Mm-hmm. But that other person that, you know, we talked about before, their trauma is a mom who left their kid at four months old to go deploy to, you know, Saudi Arabia for a year. Yeah. There's a there's a trauma that they 
the, 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 but we are like as veterans, we have to stop. If that, per, if you're gonna be someone's like 2 a.m. call, you just need to be the 2 a.m. call. Like, there's no, yep, there's no judgment. Yeah, there's no there's judgment. No thinking about it. You're just there to support them. Yeah, and that's and that's what we're trying. I think that's what we the the message of be there. We I think we stole somebody else's hashtag. I don't know, <laughs> but yeah. but it's it, it's important. It's like you have to you have to be the person to be there. You have to yeah. And, and, and I've, I've been guilty before, like people like Jason would like gave me the eye about, about some stuff before you always want like in the military, you always want to like, it's our, it's our nature. We have to realize who we are. We, we have to, we have to try to one up each other. Like I did three deployments. Why did four? Like, I mean, it, but does three and four make does a difference? It really right? matter. One could have been the reason that you yeah. will never be the same. Yeah. It could have been the four, first one that changed. Yeah. That's it. what I'm saying. One is the reason that you will never, ever be the same person ever again. Four is just like icing on the cake. It's yeah. just adding. Right. Right. But we will be like, I serve for, you know, I serve, I did four, you know, tours and I'm perfectly fine. You're not. Um, but that well, person who did one and they're complaining about something, they're a pussy or they're, they can't hack it, which is, that's a stigma we have to break amongst our community. That right? is the stigma. You know, if a person gets hit by the train, it's not the caboose that kills them. <laughs> he can't send some stuff that I've never heard in my entire life, which I love. It's like, that's true, right? That's true. So it's almost <laughs> always the first one. Almost. <laughs> it's probably always the... <laughs> so Dan's the only person in the room that's going to get this joke. The CPT code book. Do you have your favorite CPT code? Mine is there's a CPT code, which is is, is how you bill in, in healthcare <laughs> for a person that's been sucked through a jet engine, right? There's a CPT code for that. But the one that's my favorite is that there's one for a follow up visit for that person. And I'm telling you, if right. you get sucked through a jet engine, there ain't no follow up visit. <laughs> there is one. I remember seeing it on like craziest videos. You get sucked through and they pull him out alive. No kidding. I'll, I'll find it. Damn. So there is a reason for that CPT <laughs> code. Screwed Ken's whole life on that. Oh man, I yeah. just I'm I, I'm just I'm, I'm I'm blown away. And the other one is falling space junk. If you get hit by there's a CPT code for getting hit by falling space junk. It just blows my mind. But the 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 reason that I say that is it it kills the one upmanship. It's not the fourth deployment that differentiates you from the person that only had one. But there is a, there. But Ken, I'm I'm 100 with you. I but I'm just telling you in our community, mm -hmm. there is that is something that's fucking killing us all. It is because there's it we are we are we is. are engaging ourselves. We're comparing ourselves to other people, and when someone tells us something, that person is reaching out. We're like, "What the fuck is wrong with you? I did, I did this, or I did that." And yeah. that person's like, "Oh shit, I shouldn't feel this way." Like, the, yeah, the, yeah. Like, what are you talking about? And they should. The, the, that's like we talked about before. It's there's, the individual there's experience. There's six people. There's six people down here right now. Something can happen today, um, right now, and how we process or what happens, it's going to be different. Everybody's going to experience and it. If different. someone is like. I'm never coming back into your basement again. That's your shame, but um, the, your your problem. But no, but it's like that. That's the thing is that I think the the veteran community. I think I think we're actually contributing to that. Yeah. Um, when we're talking to the people, it's like when you talk to someone that like, and it's hard, like I don't care who you are. And it, you have to t t like look yourself in the mirror, and someone says like, I have achieved this. Like one of my classmates just pinned on. Uh, his first start. Okay. Like if I'm going to evaluate my, my military career, I underachieved compared to him. Compared to him. Yeah. Like, yeah. but if I like, but in reality, if I'm like looking at it in reality, how it works. And if you look at numbers and all this kind of shit, there's nothing that's how it worked. That's always been a reverse pyramid, right? There's going to be yeah. a certain number, but like, if I'm going to be like, Oh my God, everything that I've ever done in my community, in my, in my time and, you know, 10 years on active duty, it doesn't mean anything compared to what this person did. That's bullshit. It's it's inaccurate. Yeah, I like how you change it. Like it's inaccurate. I'll say that it's better. Like I'm, it's, but it's, it's not a reality of like where you should be living. But some people yeah, will be like, yeah. what he's achieving is who he what he achieved. Right? There's, yeah. There's some things he's went through that I didn't go through. Right. Yeah, but that doesn't make that person 
more but in successful. Our, but, but, no, but but in our in our community, I think it is. It a, does. Like there's like if you look at our community is like different than we're the same. Like I want to be clear. Like I. I you so know, like so how would you change that in your community? I think that one thing like I'm talking about is like, I don't like, I, this is funny. You're Ken's asking me. I'm like, I'm on the spot now, but I, I think a lot of it just comes down to is you have to put aside our egos. Like people in the military are type a personalities. Most of us, mm -hmm. we, we have egos. Um, it, it, some of the guests I've had now, like, like I've, I've heard quotes as like, I joined the Marine Corps to be the baddest motherfucker on the planet. Sure. So there's all this kind of stuff. Like, but, When, when like all the dust settles, we're all, we're, we're the same. Like, like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, like I look at my classmate who, who he's, he's been in the military for over 30 years now. He sacrificed a lot of things for a long time that I gave up 20 years ago. Right. Right. And you know, when he, you know, if you fast forward to the, the two things you talked about the past, right? Like his past, his, his future is great. Right. Five years from now, his, the past may creep on him, the depression, like what he'd given up, like, you know what I mean? So in my community, I think a lot of things is like, we're, we're anybody that's in the military is my brother and sister. Like we're, we're a small percentage of people. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, it doesn't make us any better than anyone else. It makes us different. Yeah. And uh, I think a lot of things that comes down to is like you said, how I changed the community. If it was me, is like, you have to, when someone's reaching out to you, you have to forget about who you are, what you've achieved, in the military, what your accolades, your ribbons, which is like, which is, the military is all about those things like ribbons, badges, mm -hmm. patches, um, all these things. Like you have to forget about that, right? You have yeah. to really like talk about that person that. Um, you you said the right perspective. They're your brothers and your sisters. Yeah, they they're all they're like, but everybody's my brother and sister though. Well, the right? world would be a better place if they were. They, but they are for us. It's like for they are. Like I've, I've, yeah. Ev the everything I've given up for me about me is for my brothers and sisters because they're the people right and left. But it's for people that I've never met before. You know, I mean, I've given up right. tons of things. So we, that's a, the part about the military. I think is where we all the things that are like bouncing around in the atmosphere in your head that you overthink. Right? You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. You you tend to overthink, and and you're hypercritical. We, we, we definitely overthink, right? Yeah, you're hypercritical, and it's that overthinking that leads you to say, "I should over if I'd only, or it's all my fault." And and you know that's that's inaccurate. You're being hypercritical of, of yourself, and and you you know so first you set your expectations really high. And then it doesn't come out exactly as you dreamed or fantasized that it was. So then you're hypercritical of yourself and your whole day goes to hell in a handbasket and, and you're stuck. Well, you need somebody to be there to support you. And and you can be that. But the person. system is, that's what the system breeds in us, though, Ken. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. some of us feel the same way you felt about like a connection into like social work. Some of us felt that connection to military. Like I can't even tell you when I, I can't tell you when I didn't, remember not wanting to be in the army right yeah like I, I can't remember that that like i can't remember like that's always what i thought like you're out 10 11 years old playing like like that's what i like i'm like what are you guys doing these guys are like what can i do i'm like pussy where i'm doing the army like you know what i mean like in your mind like those things that 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 in your mind like we 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 feel that way and then we we are connected to like this and then we're in an organization that says to us, like, we're better than everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and re in reality, we're, I don't, are we? No. I don't know. I don't know. That's don't only for we you are. to define. I think as the years go on, we're not better than anybody else. Yeah. We're different. That's the way I looked at it. Like, yeah. Or you had a different like, experience. No, I think we're different. Like, I mean, there's a, it takes a certain person. Like, I've, I've known people that I have, like, I have friends that, like, have never missed, they have, they have a 17 year old kid that's never missed a practice mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or a game for, like, baseball. Mm -hmm. And their kid's 17 years old. Yeah. And if I am in a, in a comfortable atmosphere and somebody asked me, I was like, those fucking people need to get a life. That kid is like, 
no kid wants you to be there from age five to 17. That kid, their kid may want that. That that kid may need that. Yeah. Right. So I'm, I'm, we're different. Like, I mean, like that person's different. I think that's the kid you asked me before is like, we're, we're not better. We're different. Okay. And it's a weird difference. It's a difference that we have to be different for a reason. Mm-hmm. Right, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I don't know. I feel like Ken is like super analyzing right now. <laughs> <laughs> you afford a third hour? Yeah. What's up now? Nah, uh, you hour could. <laughs> so, you know, a, 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 that- a bigger part of this is is that it's not just your brothers and sisters in the military. It's the bigger mission that you're on protecting people that you don't even know. Right. But we've done that. We've given up all these things. We've given up the past. We've sacrificed our future right. for people we don't know. Mm-hmm. Right. Why would that not set up confusion in your mind? It does. Absolutely. hundred percent. I'm not saying yeah. it doesn't. Why, why wouldn't it? Right. But it's, that's what I'm saying. Normal, that's why we're talking about this. This is like, it is a normal, normal response. Yeah, of course it's a normal. Response. But I think if you're talking about people, there's some people that will tell you if they're if you if you share your experience with how you think, they're gonna mm-hmm. look at you like you are crazy. That person that says you haven't been to every one of your kids' games, right? You're not a right. good father. Right, right. And that happens a lot. Like, like I don't like I'm in the third kid of travel baseball. I cannot fucking wait for August of this year. It's over. Yeah. Financially, <laughs> exactly. emotionally. Exactly. <laughs> Physically. I mean, physically, I'm like, and I feel, but what I'm saying is like, they're a parent, they're a parent that that's their first kid, right? Yeah. Their, 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 their oldest kid is my youngest kid's age. And they're like, oh, why isn't Shay hit there? He's not a good parent. Like, I'm absolutely a good parent. I, I'm leading him in a different way. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Like, this whole thing is, it's like, it's a, like you asked me about it before. It's like, I think we feel like we're special in the military, right? Yeah. Are we special? Probably not. We're different. You're different. Right. And I think that's a key. If you're asking me personally, like how I would, I'm, I'm combating it. It's like, I, it took me a long time to be like, I thought for a long time, I'm special. I'm better than you. Like if mm-hmm. you didn't serve the country, fuck you. Like, honestly, right. that's how we feel. Like you right. can't think that way. Right. Cause not everybody feels the same way. Like, I think it's like absolutely crazy that you spent 20 years in social work. Yeah. If I'm being out, like, yeah, that's fine. Like, you know what I mean? Like, a co- like it's not, there's all these things, but it doesn't. And I think with veterans, I think the problem is that we, we put ourselves in this level of like, we're better than everybody else. And we're not, we're just different. You are different. And that's okay. There, there isn't any reason that that would be a good or a bad. You've just had different experiences and not everybody's going to understand that. And, you know, if, if somebody were to say to me, they've been to every single game and practice for their kid since their kid was born and started T-ball at age five, Are they a little I, not so soon? I, I would say to them, get a fucking life. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This is the validation I've been waiting for. So uh, I had to, to, I had to throw you a bone at some point. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, you know, I'm talking to them. They, no, but it's the truth. But that's the thing. It's, it's the like, truth. Yeah. They're, they're helicopter parents and they're living vicariously through their children. Your life experience has taught you that's not the way to go. I'm done. I'm joking. I'm going to drop the mic. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I throw him a bone. But no, if I were to do that, that's the thing. It's like, so now we're talking about suicide. It's getting towards the end of it where like Jason's getting antsy. Um, over there, he's he's he, he's eating like an eat. <laughs> He's on everything to digest. Um, <laughs> More personally, we want to get back to you. So you've done mm-hmm. a lot of things. Like we're talking about Ken. I want to. Every, what's interesting about this is like it's different than everything we've done. So we haven't talked a lot about you, mm-hmm. right? Um, other than like you shared right off the bat, like mushrooms, boom, boom, it's good. But um, you wrote a book. Yeah, you co-authored a book. I have a couple books. Eight books. Why is that not on your LinkedIn? You're like leaving me hanging. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. I you know, I, it's in my CV. It's in my core dossier. And he but... sent me like everybody's like, I didn't know how to handle them. Like, send me your bio. He sends like a paragraph. I'm like, down here, not a bad place to be drinking whiskey and researching people. I can't complain. But 
I'm looking at your publications. There was five that I had, but he, like yeah. one of your publications, the main one is a crisis intervention handbook. Yep. Assessment, treatment, research, right? Yes. Been translated into four different languages. It was just recently translated into Chinese with complex characters. It is the only textbook in the country of China for teaching crisis intervention. Boom. How about that? Boom. How about that research, Ken? He, he tried to he, leave me out of that. I feel good about that now. So yeah. another one that you is the comprehensive handbook of social work and social welfare. Yes. Is a, that you, you contributed to that yes. as well? Yes, I did. Um, my dear, my dear friend and mentor, um, Al Roberts was dying of pancreatic cancer and I finished that book for him. Um, so who's Jaeger KR? That's me. I'm joking. Around. Yeah, <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> I'm kidding with you, by the way. Yep, yep. Um, th this, uh, it always goes back to when you did your master's and how they do the, your, you know, the writing the book and your references. That, that, that's, yep, it that's, gave me like trauma. It went back to trauma of like looking yep. at who it is. But, yep. but no, so, so like some of the things we talked about with Ken, I think of coming on that you have to talk about is like he, he shared with you his education. Um, you know, licenses certifications we talked about before he's a lisw-s mm -hmm. licensed independent social worker with supervisory yeah so, so that means i train right. i train um a licensed independent chemical uh depends dependency counselor yep um been doing that for a long time and then you know the publication some of the honors so well the question i had about like we're talking about more about you now okay like so honors and awards like ken is 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 awarded the Ohio State Star Award in 2017. Yeah. The Walter Family Foundation funding, which was that's that's and uh, then also the the Ohio State University of Social Work Outstanding Community Instructor Award in 2010. Yeah. So of all your awards, publications, like what are you most proud what all those like you know, like you're a military guy, you have all your awards, what what are you most proud of? What are those like what are, all those accomplishments, what are you most proud of? Um Probably the pocket guide to crisis interventions. So the crisis interventions, the big book. You you you'd asked if I'd send it over. I was gonna buy one. I was like, I'm gonna get into this. Yeah, it's, it's like seventy bucks. I was like, oh shit, it's gonna take me. And it's eight, I will I will tell you fifty pages. I didn't I'll think read, you had time I'll read to it read eventually, it. but I was like, there's yeah. no way I'm gonna be able to read it in time to do that. Yeah, yeah. Jason no. knows about when I have to read yeah. a book. Jason's like, you need to read this book, and I'm like, <laughs> down yeah. to the wire. But um. No, it's it's the pocket guide to crisis intervention, and I mentioned my mentor Al um, Al Roberts, Rutgers University, and Al called me on um, on April Fool's Day and said, "Hey, I want I want you, uh, to do a pocket guide to the to the big book so that you could put it in the pocket of your lab coat if you were called on a crisis situation." And it's just a kind of an outline. It's says you know the cliff notes for that. And I said, great, uh, how long will it take? And he said, the contract will be on your doorstep when you get home. So what's the first thing you do when you got a book contract? You rip it open, you find out what the due date is. <laughs> it's April 1st. The due date was June 5th of that year. And and I called my buddy out and I said, is this an April Fool's joke? You're, you, you're giving me X amount of days to write the entire book? And he said, Ken, what does a diagnosis of stage four pancreatic cancer mean to you? And it's like, that's a diagnosis that nobody ever wants to have. He says, yes, yeah, mine. Yeah. And um, I need you to carry the water on this. And um, I got the book written and I had sent the final manuscript to him. Um, June 5th happens to be my birthday. And I sent it to him instead of going out and celebrating with my family and being with my family. Um, I got an email back from Al at about 1230 is actually June 6th. And he said, read, the email just said reads beautifully. And his wife shared with me that he died four hours later. So that book is to honor my, my uh, beautiful friend. And I am so glad that it's been translated and is traveling around the world because that means Al's still educating around the world. That's what's important to him. Um, the, I didn't realize that's an impact. I was like, I'm more of like, this is why I also realized that I should sometimes just shut the fuck up about <laughs> things, but, about that. 
I kind of sensed that there was something behind that. Like I didn't know, but uh, like I, I would love to have a copy if you can get one. Yeah. Um, I would love to have it. I'll read it. Would um, you like the one that's in but Chinese? But I love the, but the thing, <laughs> the Chinese. I'm talking. I'm, but you talk about like a, like a, like a guidebook, yeah. which sides in the military. Like we have a bunch of shit we stick in pouches that are yeah. like that that are to help us get through a ton of crises. Is like like you know like call for fire, a bunch of other things that we do. Like it's crazy. So that it's you know that's a. Researching, but I was funny. I wanted to get this, get a copy of it. And mainly, I wanted to quote you uh -huh. out of the book, which is we had somebody earlier that that's awesome to be able to quote your guests. Yeah, yeah. but they know that I, I'm gonna quote him later um, as we end it. But um, thank you for that. But so now we're talking about like I think we're we're getting close to the end of it. Mm -hmm. I have just a couple more questions that I want to answer. So. I want to ask you that that I think are important with what we're doing the podcast and 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 because of just directly to veterans like I, I again like I think it's been apparent in the past couple hours like I understand that we're not special um I think that took a long time for me to realize that mm -hmm. and but we we're different and we're different in, in, in a different way that is like it's astronomically different than anybody else we're killing ourselves at a rate that yeah, is is right. unheard of. Like, right? That just yeah. it's 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 it. I don't. Even, that, that's why I did this. You know, a year ago. Um, so, what would you like? Back to the, you're talking about, and, and I'm going to put into a term that I don't know. It's like what 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 would your advice be to someone who's listening, a veteran that's suffering from PTSD, which is what we've been labeled with a, a ton of the times. Like that's one thing. That's one term that I'm glad we didn't talk about because. The PTSD stigma is is I think it's a stigma. It's it's yeah. it it comes back to trauma. Like it's it's like we've 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 been dealt with we've been we've dealt with a lot of trauma. So like yeah. I'll I'll go like struggling with like our inability to deal with trauma, PTSD, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and thoughts of, of suicide. What would you tell a veteran who's struggling with that today? Like someone that's listening right now. What would you? What would I say to them? What would you say to them? You're not alone. You're not alone, and no matter how much you think that people don't understand you, there are people out there that deeply understand what you're experiencing and are willing to help you. People that you wouldn't even think understand you or could help you want to help you. You are not alone. Huge words. I think is. I'm at it. So the other question, the, the second question I had is so so we we've said on this podcast many times is or I have said it is I I'm too stubborn or stupid to not have done that right like I thought I've contemplated suicide before um, I'm not gonna give in to it it just it it doesn't not who I am um, mm -hmm. but we've had a, we've had I guess on before whose husband or ex-husband committed suicide we all know like it's it's, it's crazy how much that veteran suicide has touched everybody in this room like like yeah. everybody in this room it, it's nuts within it, it it's crazy so um what can family members do that suspect that they have a veteran who's in that stage you talk about the isolation or mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what do you recommend them doing? What, like, what, what, what do you like? If, if it's Ask all them. about saving the life, like, yeah. what, like, what do you do? Ask them. Ask them if you're thinking of hurting yourself. There, people are afraid to ask that question, and there is no risk of causing a person to harm themselves by asking them if they they are thinking about harming themselves. The the research has been done. It's completely understand that if somebody's thinking of harming themselves, asking them is not going to push them to it. In fact, they're going to be relieved that you're asking them if they're thinking of harming themselves. Right. I've, I've read that a lot. It's like there's a people that think like if I ask and they say that that's going to be the tipping point. It's not, yeah, they've it's already, not. Yeah, it's not. Um, in fact, there's a relief when somebody asks because it's they get it. They know where I am. So don't be afraid to ask and always be there to help. If you're going to ask, then, then you got to be there to help and, yeah. and you got to stick it through and you got to write it out. And, and I promise you at the other end, it'll be worth the ride. The ride will suck at times, but it will be well worth the ride.
Yeah, and I think that's an important thing you said before. It's like the the ride. Like I uh, like I I think there's there's a couple people I've, I've in my lifetime that have called me and we talked about some stuff and I that you asked that question and it ends up being like literally a six or you know a six five hour conversation and then yeah. you reconvene and you talk about it for another seven eight like that's the that's the thing is like ask the question and and be there to listen like we talked about their hashtag be there like it's the truth like be there it, this isn't like just ask the question and forget about it you have to you have to be ready to listen right yeah you have to be there you have to listen that's not that's not something that you take lightly which is a lot of pressure on someone so yeah i would say the thing too is like if you ask that person you ask that initial question which is the hardest question do you want to hurt somebody and they they say yes like energize your resources, right? Like, you know, like reach out to people like us, like anybody in the admin group or whatever, like anybody that you know that can relate to them that, you know, will like, will, will listen, right? Like, yeah. I think that's the whole thing is like that, that first question is an important one, but it, and it's, it's not, a, it's not a hard question to ask, right? No, it's not a hard question to ask, but it is though. Well, it's, like, it's, if it's, if it's, ask me, am I going to kill myself? Like I plan on killing myself tomorrow, Ken. Yeah. Well, then we need to talk. Right, because but you it's, are you equipped to do that, right? Yeah, some people aren't, but that you need to, the next step is like I think is to find someone that 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 person to to listen to them. Like the, the most pivotal question is the per, is to ask whether they're doing it right. That's my yeah. mind, right? Yep. And then use your resource. It's like the only thing. It's like make those connections. Get them to yeah. the place where they're going to be safe. And and it doesn't always mean inpatient hospitalization. In fact, I've worked in psychiatry for twenty eight years. And I think inpatient hospitalizations oftentimes is the worst. Answer. Yeah, you talked about that, like like for veterans, you said that was one of the worst things to do. It's one of the worst things to do. Uh, you, you know, veterans are independent souls. And, and we need to trust that unless they're telling us that they can't do it, that an outpatient basis is probably the best way to approach this. Yeah, I guess we've been told so many times to do things i i, I like i look like i look about being independent like you, you say we're independent souls it's fine yeah. most people won't think we were most yeah. people think military people are like subservient follow all your kind of like do yeah your that's not the case we're not like we we under we we there's a part of us that every time someone told us to do something we're like not every time but a lot of times you're like this is the most stupid fucking thing i ever did mm -hmm. right yeah but I'm in an organization that we're supposed to follow this person. We do that. So like we, we are independent, but I think a lot of people think we're just these like yeah, robots the or we are case. super like we're the most, I think we're super independent. We, we have a lot of different thoughts of you, you, you are told to follow an order, but you're independent upon how you execute it. And execution is survival. Which is true. True. So we're coming, like, Ken, I, I ask, is there anything else you want to add to what we talked about to the yeah. convention community that I miss? You know, I, I think that we've covered pretty much everything I wanted to cover here. Um, I, I would just emphasize that if somebody's struggling with hypervigilance, avoidance, control, trust, and they're shutting down, then those are the warning signs that you need to watch for right. and, and interacting with those are so important. And, you know, we've, we've got crisis lines out there. We've got the national suicide number now, the nine eight eight number, which hopefully will revolutionize, right, yeah. you know, like nine one one revolutionized medical health. Nine eight eight should do the same thing. For yeah. And it's health. true. Like nine eight, it's, it's absolutely that. Those, if, like, like Ken said, if you're contemplating suicide, absolutely reach out to the Veterans Crisis Hotline at 988. Or if you want to go old school, 1-800-273-8255 or press 1 or text 838-255. You, you definitely have to be reaching out. To, but the, the that is a, that's, it's a great step. And the, one of the great steps we talked about a couple of weeks ago was like now they're covering, you know, they're, they're covering emergency vet, you know, visits yes. for veterans, which I think is huge. But, um, you know, I think, you know, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on. Um, when Dan connected us, I was like that. I felt like I was going to, I was selling the group. Like it was a, yeah. a point of time. And, and within like a minute, I was like, I don't need to sell this to Ken. Ken gets it. I got it. Um, and, and I really appreciate that. I really, you know, and a lot of other people need to get it. Like, you know what I mean? And I'm not saying we're any different than anyone else. 
I think, you know, tonight I hope you talk about, like, I, I'm, I'm, most of us understand trauma, mm-hmm. um, but we're not alone in our trauma. Everyone's done it, but our, our trauma is different. And, and yeah. a lot of it is, is you ask me if I think about it and I'm, I have to, I want to think about this later, but I probably contributed to that stigma or onto somebody else. Like you're scared to do this. What are you a pussy? Like, I can't tell me times like, like Jason, are you scared to fly? On, are you scared to go fly? No. He's lying. He's lying. <laughs> no, but, they, but he understands the yeah, risk. Like, he you know what I mean? he, yeah. He yeah, gets it. There's a risk that it. goes into it. Like yeah. it is what it is, but there's a different thing about it. So I, I, I appreciate you coming on. Um, well, I have to thank you and commend you for the risk because this is probably one of the hardest topics to talk about. <laughs> And I, it's, it probably sucked all of the fun out of the room because it's a serious topic. Um, but, you know, not everybody's willing to take the risk to talk about it. And I commend you for being willing to take the risk to talk about it openly. And I, I appreciate that. And I'm not alone in this thing. You know, the, the, you know, I started this a long time, you know, not a long time ago, but like years, a long time ago to me, but like an idea that I thought to just try to make a difference. And um, there's a lot of people that, most of them are down here. A couple of them aren't. Um, but I appreciate that. I accept that from a lot of us. That's what we're trying to do is it's, 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 it's difficult for conversation. Um, you know, behind the scenes, we're, we're trying to do great things. Like we're raising money to give money to children whose, you know, mom or dad committed suicide. And mm-hmm. anytime mm-hmm. you talk about this conversation, it's hard. It's like, it's, it, it's hard. And it should, should it be hard or should it not be hard? That's the thing. It, it, it's a it's, difficult conversation to have. Like I, it's it's always hard. Yeah, it, it's it's awkward. It's it's and everybody that's that's that listens in. Like you know, like we have you know seven listeners right now. If you're being you're watching. I think the high we got to was thirteen, but people going. We're getting people that watch it later on. It's like thank you for listening. And and more importantly, it's like that. If it's one person we connect to, that's all that I care about. That's all it it's takes. worth, you know. We're Jeez. planting seeds, and some will grow. Yeah, which is slow, like planting seeds is like yes, it's hard. I'm not a plant seed guy. Like, yeah. I want like immediate results. It goes back. Yeah, to it ain't gonna happen. Ken's gonna analyze me when we get off camera, but um, it's already done. <laughs> <laughs> He's like dance on this slip. Um, so <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna talk about like the elephant in the room that you know that uh, Ken talked about. The one thing that if you get, you haven't noticed, we didn't feature any whiskeys tonight. Yeah. Thank you. Who cares? Um, it, it, it's 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 irrelevant at this point. Um, you know, a lot of the feature in whiskeys is 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 this is not what the pot the the podcast or the group is about. It's not about whiskey. It's about um, connections and 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 ending the suicide epidemic. So unfortunately, like I said before, you know this this thing seems to be hitting home. It's crazy how often it hits home, right? Like yeah. it's like it, it's it's like. It's not going to happen to me, but, but I will tell you it's going to happen. Veteran suicide is going to hit you someday, somehow, and, and it needs to stop. So tonight we're going to we're gonna go into the dark. You know, Ken talked about sucking the air out of the room. I'm about to suck it back out, whatever air came back in. But what, tonight we're going to honor um, a local Marine who committed suicide uh, recently. So tonight we're going to honor U.S. Marine Sergeant Brandon J. Kurtz, 37 years old. Uh, Brandon took his life on February 5th, 2023. Brandon was born on October 10th, 1985 in, in Ohio. He was a graduate of Hilliard Davidson High School, class of 2004. After graduating from high school, Brandon enlisted in the United States Marine Corps Reserves. Brandon had one combat deployment to Afghanistan in 2012. Uh, Brandon owned his own business, Kurtz Marble and Granite, which he started in 2014. Uh, Brandon enjoyed spending time with his family, especially the joy of his life, his daughter Jenna. Brandon loved playing his guitar, reading nature, and going camping with his daughter. Brandon is survived by his parents, Jeffrey and Tamara Kurtz, daughter, Jenna Lynn Kurtz, sister, Shelby Levinson, brother, Larry Kurtz, grandparents, Shirley and Jesse Green, and many aunts, uncles, cousins, nephews, and Marines and, and friends. So uh, the last thing is like Semper Fi Marines. There's a, it, it's, it's crazy. But like I said earlier, um, and, and like Ken mentioned, there's a lot of resources out there. If, if you're c- contemplating suicide or someone that you know is, you definitely have to reach out to the Veterans Crisis Hotline at 988 or dial 1-800-273-8255, press 1 or text 
two five five. Um, there's people like Ken. There's people like Ken that are out there to help. Like, um, you change my mind on your community, like your your people. Good, and I appreciate that. That's that's why I move forward. This is like there's there's people like him that really care. Like you know, like I thought I had to sell this to him um, to come on here. You didn't, and just like talking to you for two hours, it's like I feel like I can't tell you anything. So. When we got off camera, he's probably gonna be here till about one, two thirty in the morning. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm joking. So, a um, couple quotes though. So, I love that people that have written books or 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 type of stuff it's like you. You wouldn't give me your book to talk about, but um, I posted one quote earlier this earlier a couple weeks ago that I want to read before I talk about your quote, right? Okay. That you put, but so so I think this is important that like the things we talked about. So this is from. Once a warrior, always a warrior. I posted this earlier a couple weeks ago, maybe or like a week ago. But the truth is that warriors are in some ways best prepared to handle the most complex human emotions a person can endure. But it may take a while to appreciate this. And I think that's the things we talked about. It's it just kind of hit home to me. And that's that's a quote from uh, Colonel Charles W. Hogue, retired, once a, a warrior, always a warrior. And then we're going to end it in episode 26, which – Daniel, the lost episode number one, thought it was like, what did he say it was like 13 earlier? <laughs> Obviously, he's not looking like, I'm like, damn, Daniel, what have we been doing for a year? But uh, we're going to quote Kenneth Yeager. Uh-oh. Um, and I think it was from your, your one of your profiles that I was searching, like I was stalking you last night mm -hmm. down here. So this journey is not what I do. It is what I've lived every day trying to bring help to those who recognize they can't do it alone and offer opportunities to those who want to take the first few steps to improve their mental, emotional situation. Yeah. So I, 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 I I'm going to end it at that. And I think uh, the, the past two hours you've conveyed that. And I just want to, again, thank you for coming on and, and uh, thank you for everything you do every day to help not just our community, but every community to, to see the light. It's an honor and a gift. Thank you so much for having me. All right. We'll see you guys in a couple weeks. Good night, everyone.